Welcome to Tomorrow. I'm Athena and I'm going to be your Capcom. The rest of the crew today is Ben, Mike, and we have Jared. Ben, what do we have first in news? Well, today we're going to be talking about a dust storm putting Oppie into safe mode. And Mike? Ooh. Don't worry, SpaceX is planning even more expansions at Kennedy Space Center. And then on the observation deck, we have Jared with an interview. Yes, we've got Kim Stedman in here at the actual <laughs> observation deck in the studio. A Kim, systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, will be talking about some cool missions that have been happening and coming up. And then we all get back together to look at your comments and questions from last week's show. This is Tomorrow Orbit 11.24. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now before we jump right in, I want to give a huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. These people, they contribute $10 per episode. Um, our Escape Velocity citizens get worldwide free shipping in the Tomorrow Swag Store, voting rights on upcoming roundtable discussions, access to our Escape Velocity Discord channel, where new short show ideas are born, and of course, if you'd like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now, this week, I spy a launch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mike, what is it? Very good way of putting that. Very good way of putting that. Oh, man. <laughs> so what exactly was this launch of? <laughs> this was a launch of a all-weather radar spy satellite for the Japanese government that launched on an H-2A rocket uh, earlier this week on Tuesday. Uh, so this was a very cool launch. <laughs> This H-2A launch occurred on Tuesday, June 12th at 4.20 Coordinated Universal Time from the Tanagashima Space Center in southern Japan, heading south over the Pacific Ocean with the aid of two solid strap-on rocket boosters. Now, the strap-on boosters burned out less than two minutes after liftoff, followed by the payload fairing jettison around four minutes into the mission. And then the first stage engine switched off approximately six and a half minutes after launch, followed by the stage separation. The upper stage engine, burning a mixture of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen ignited to place Japan's newest surveillance satellite into a polar orbit. Now, JAXA confirmed in a statement that the information gathering satellite deployed as planned from the H-2A's upper stage. And JAXA and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, the H-2A rocket prime contractor, did not provide a live webcast of Tuesday's launch. Uh, Japanese launch officials typically provide live video coverage of space launches, but not for missions carrying the country's spy satellites. Now, for this particular satellite, it's named the IGS Radar 6 satellite, and it carries a synthetic aperture radar imaging page Payload, which is capable of resolving objects on the ground day and night, regardless of weather conditions, so it can see through clouds. Um, and with this, the spacecraft specifications, including its imaging performance, are kept secret by the Japanese government. We do know, though, that the IGS Radar 6 satellite is Japan's seventh radar reconnaissance satellite. Uh, the radar observers uh, operate in tandem with the uh, uh, optical surveillance satellites, which offer better resolution, but only when they have clear skies overhead in order to do that. Now, Japan started its spy satellite program in 1998 after a North Korean missile uh, flew over Japanese territory. And with this launch, it uh, marks the 39th launch of an H-2A rocket, the second H-2A launch of the year, and the fourth orbital launch for Japan overall this year. So uh, congratulations to everyone who was involved with that. Either way, regardless of the payload, it was still cool <laughs> to see that, uh, the, that rocket footage. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I, there is a question in the chat. I'm wondering if you might know the answer to it. It comes from Vax Headroom. He says, I think it's technically in low power mode. Am I right? No, I, I think we're talking that about, uh, that's the oppy. So in the, in the open, ah. I said that opportunity was right. in safe Oops. mode. That's all right. So you want to transition over to Oppie? Got it. Let's transition. Let's transition. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah actually, so, something on Mars. One of the one of the awesome things about yeah, having Kim right, right behind on. us is wait, you had wait. There were no more launches, right? That was the only launch, right? I think that, that was the only launch only this launch. week. Uh, later on today, actually, there's going to be a launch of a Russian satellite, uh, a GLONASS M satellite, uh, launching on a Soyuz 2 1B. However, because it's also a government payload, we probably won't see any live streams of that. If we will, it'll be through the Russian Defensive Ministry uh, YouTube channel. Uh, otherwise, they'll uh, upload footage that we'll see, like, you know, 30 seconds of like the five different angles of launch, you know, and that's all that they might upload after the fact. So, but that's going to be happening later today so we'll uh, definitely talk about that next week in detail yeah awesome very cool so now well yeah. to get into the news yeah, uh, yeah. Let's, talking about api yeah let's um, let's get back to vax headroom's uh, point which is I, mm -hmm. I think it's technically in low power mode right uh, as opposed to what i said safe mode and i think uh i think uh yeah, I think safe mode is actually the wrong term to use because, okay. uh, all right, so for those who don't know, Opportunity has been on Mars for a very, very long time. It was a 90-day mission. It is currently 14 years into wow. its 90-day mission. That's over 5,000 souls, uh, souls, sorry, uh, Mar or Martian days. And uh, yeah, that launched July 7th, 2003. Unfortunately, it has dropped out of contact with Earth after powering down everything but its master clock. And the image on the screen is why. There is a massive planet-wide dust storm happening right now. Now, Oppy uh, is basically, a sol for the most part, a solar-powered vehicle. And so when it can't see the sun to recharge its batteries, it can't work. And, uh, you know, I actually have the exact numbers in here. Uh, let's see here. Um, on May 30th, Opportunity's batteries were delivering 645 watt hours of energy. Two days later, those levels dropped nearly in half at 345 watt hours. The very next day, they dropped 133 watt hours, and that forced mission manager to suspend science operations on June 8th. Then, two days after June 8th, so June 10th, uh, the energy levels had dropped to just 22 watt hours. So on a nominal day, they're at 645 watt hours, and then by June 10th, they're at 22 watt hours. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of see again, uh, you know, the, the basically the giant dust storm kicking up. And when that co covers the photovoltaics or the solar panels on the rover, it prevents the batteries from being charged. It prevents energy generation from occurring, which means less things can actually operate. Uh, and you know, that's. That's not good. So it goes into a mode where uh, basically uh, the master clock is the only thing that's running. And every once in a while, the master clock says, hey, wake up. Uh, tell me what the energy looks like. And if the energy looks good, then opportunity can kind of come out of that low energy mode. And if it doesn't, it goes back to sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it, it waits a little while longer. It keeps kind of going into that cycle of like, hey, can I do this? No, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Um, I, if the low power levels drop far enough, that's to the point where even the master clock doesn't have enough power to continue to tick. Uh, the remote, the rover is simply going to remain asleep until the sky is clear. So basically at this point, there's no energy on opportunity. The master clock basically has to stop. There's no power to run it. Mm. So it's going, to, it's going to shut down. But then once the sun comes back out, the solar panels can recharge those batteries. The system will actually wake itself back up. It'll wake up the flight computer, and then it's going to call home. Uh, so Kim will actually probably have to talk about what happens from that moment forward if it gets that far. Uh, I would assume that once it calls home, it actually has to understand where it is in its mission again, because I, I would assume it kind of like doesn't know anymore. And so we have to mm -hmm. tell it, hey, this is how far into your mission you are. This is where you're at. But again, mm. Kim will have to describe that a little bit yeah. better than I. Uh, so that would be a... Uh, uh, an interesting story. Now, uh, one interesting thing is that this is this happened to Opportunity, uh, which was the the sister spacecraft to, to Spirit, uh, but it did not happen to Curiosity. And the main reason for that is Curiosity is a nuclear rover, whereas Opportunity and Spirit were photovoltaic; they were solar powered rovers. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you need the sun to operate, then you need to be able to right. see the sun. Yeah. Uh, if you can use um, uh, um, self generated power, then that doesn't become as much of an issue. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's one of those incredible stories from JPL of like, again, it's like that 90 day, here's a 90 day rover mm -hmm. and 
over a decade later, this thing is still going strong. Yeah. It's just, it's just absolutely incredible. I like to call it the Jet Propulsion Laboratory instead of laboratory. Laboratory. Because, <laughs> laboratory, because I feel like they're all ever so slightly like mad geniuses, but like the good <laughs> kind, and you gotta say laboratory to properly convey that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really great. Well, I know that we were gonna talk a little bit more later um, with Kim, but if you happen to know the answer to this from oh, sure. uh, GC Astro Outreach, they ask, uh, what do you think the chances are that of Alpi coming back out of sleep mode after the storm subsided, considering it needs the solar panels to recharge, and they'll probably be covered in the thick dust. Uh, that's assuming they're covered in, so that's kind of what are. happened to Spirit, right? right? So Spirit got stuck in the panels in a, in a non-optimal angle, and I believe they slowly got coated and then basically came down. Um, uh, we talked about I mean, this last week about yeah, how like sometimes storms. during um, certain storms it can actually clean off the panels uh, from dust that has already accumulated depending on how much uh, you know wind forces it's being exposed to. So there could be a chance that the solar panels will be even more effective after the storm. We'll have to see. It could go either yeah. way. Uh, it sounded like from what I saw in the meeting that uh, this is going to... Um, they, they are highly optimistic of it coming out of sleep mode. So, uh, there, you know, there's always there's always a little bit of concern, but I got the impression that no, no, we're we're, we're pretty optimistic that this this will be a temporary mm. thing, and we think it'll come back out. Oh, well, uh, Jared actually says that Kim says that uh, they won't be covered in thick dust. Uh, they just have heavy dust on the rovers, and they've gotten 300 watts. We just need to have Kim um, in the studio, yeah. ready to go. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> oh, this, is, this is great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is real, awesome. real time. There, so there yeah. you go. So awesome, very cool. That's, that's what's awesome. happening on Mars <laughs> right now. <laughs> but to get back into um, Earth, then what exactly is going on here is that SpaceX is planning new facilities. Is it Mike at Kennedy Space Center? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, they put forward a uh, proposal, and there's been an environmental assessment uh, to accommodate all the growing launch operations. Uh, SpaceX has proposed a pretty substantial increase in the different facilities that they would use there, um, and at, at there at NASA's Kennedy Space Center to be able to accommodate all the different launches of Falcon 9s and Falcon Heavies over the coming years. Um, some of the places that they're going to, to have, they're going to have a landing um, and launch control center, a processing and storage facility for its boosters, and possibly even a rocket garden. SpaceX estimates that there may be up to 10 events per year for the Falcon Heavy launch and up to 63 landings, 54 of the Falcon 9 single core landings and nine Falcon Heavy triple core landings. Uh, all of those at the current landing site or on the SpaceX drone ship, according to the uh, environmental assessment. Uh, but something else that's really interesting is there's going to be an airport-like viewing tower that's standing up to 30 stories tall, which is uh, kind of the centerpiece of SpaceX's planned uh, refurbishment uh, of their new operation space to propose for this vacant land that's at uh, KSC. Uh, the new facility is actually going to be a few miles south of the iconic vehicle assembly building, and it's going to be located near uh, Roberts Road, just west of the main uh, north-south roadway through the Space Center, and just north of the Visitor's Center on the pro proposed 67-acre site. Now, the new facility would host facilities for uh, booster and fairing processing, as well as storage and a new launch and landing control center. Um, and with the rocket garden, it would potentially display flown space vehicles. So that's the part that gets me the most excited about this, is a potential rocket garden. And I think that SpaceX should include the old Falcon 1 in this garden that's just sitting outside, exposed to the elements, not being taken care of, even though it would need an upper stage and payload carrying mock-up and who knows what else uh, uh, work done to it to be displayed. And it would be <laughs> awesome to see any surviving Falcon 1 through 4s, uh, the Block 1 through 4s uh, of Falcon Nine. And I mean, once upon a time, there was going to be a three engine Falcon uh, that was going to do the pad abort test uh, that's, uh, or rather, the uh, the launch abort test that's still supposed to happen later on. So that would be cool. Who wants to see the Falcon 3 at this uh, this site as well? That would be really <laughs> cool. Oh, man. But uh, in, any, in any case, uh, uh, in all seriousness, the control center would be large enough to contain a data center, a firing room, and an engineering room for uh, the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy and Dragon mission operations, which would be used uh, for all the operations from Pad 39A to supplement the existing control center, which is nearby Launch Complex 40. Um, a new rocket hangar at Roberts Road location would be used uh, by SpaceX to process, store, and refurbish all the different Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy first stage boosters. And uh, the proposed hangar would have an area of around 12,000 square meters and measure up to 31 meters tall. 
SpaceX could also add to the hangar a connection facility for end-of-life decommissioning of rocket components destined for uh, possibly the rocket garden. Who knows? But uh, if approved, this is still just a proposal, uh, the proposal would make NASA property available to SpaceX via an enhanced use lease agreement, uh, which is one of the goals of NASA Kennedy Space Center, uh, to have a, a multi-user spaceport and have uh, all sorts of missions supporting NASA as well as the military. And uh, NASA officials so far who reviewed SpaceX's proposal um, have concluded that it would have no significant effects on the environment. And that's where all of this information came from was the environmental assessment report. So very cool. And uh, um, we've seen how quickly SpaceX can add facilities there to Kennedy Space Center. So um, I think that that would be really cool if that launch tower is uh, also a viewing site for launches as well. That would be pretty awesome. That would be awesome. Yeah, actually, a, a Smokey Durg in the chat says that control tower looks very Jetsons, <laughs> which I definitely agree with. Mm -hmm. um, that would be a really great yeah, <laughs> viewing spot um, for, for all the launches. Um, he also does ask a question. Um, does this proposal include a combination for the BFRs um, or BFS? Did, did the they, big did Falcon rocket. There's no okay. information in this. Yeah, there's no information in this particular proposal about uh, the uh, the Big Falcon spaceship or the Big Falcon rocket. This is all just for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy yeah. operations. I mean, nine triple core Falcon Heavy like landing. That's so cool. That's yeah. oh my gosh, I, I can't wait for that to see that one day. All three of them <laughs> landing at once. Um, that's awesome. Cool. Um, so yeah, well, I think since I mean, obviously you were saying that they don't have any plans uh, for Vogue. And your question about uh, could they fit a BFR? I mean, with the the sizes of what you were saying of the facility, um, I'm sure that they would actually be able to fit the BFR, but there's no um, work working towards that right now from as far as what you were saying. But that's awesome. That's really, really exciting. So obviously, um, you know, SpaceX is looking to launch a lot of things right now into space. But speaking of space. Speaking of space. Speaking of space. Let's go back to space. Something about right. astronauts Ooh. having private astronaut expeditions. You know what all the rage, so you, you know what you, the rage used to be building your own rocket? That, yeah. That's so old school. It's old all, school? All the really? new rage now, building your own space station. Space wow. stations are I just the, new, that right they're now. the new hotness. They're it's the new the, hotness. Oh my, is it the new hashtag? <laughs> it's the new hot, build your own space station. <laughs> build, build new your hashtag. Own space station. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've actually covered Axiom Space before, I think about like, I want to say it was almost a year ago, but only in a little bit. Uh, they made a little bit, uh, they made some more announcements and they made a little bit more headway. Uh, now they're going to be offering uh, expeditions to space aboard the International Space Station. Now eventually what you're looking at right here is the Axiom Commercial Space Station Complex. Uh, you're going to be able to get, and here's the information we have now, you're going to be able to get a 10-day mission priced at $55 million each. Those first missions are slated to launch uh, sometime in the 2020s. And that $55 million, which, you know, I'll, I'll take two, uh, that price <laughs> includes transportation to and from the International Space Station and ev eventually, I believe, the Axiom Station, which is what you're looking at right now. Um, everything necessary to live and enjoy the experience while on orbit and a 15-week training experience just like the uh, actual uh, astronauts would get. Well, obviously m much more condensed, but training experience like what an astronaut would get uh, if they were, say, like an astronaut. like the would get for space adventures. Yeah, yeah, for space <laughs> adventures, exactly. Uh, so, uh, and what you're looking at here is the world's first commercial space station, although maybe, maybe not, right? Because we've got some competition in the space station uh, realm. We've got Bigelow currently attached to the International Space Station. They actually want to, Axiom wants to take one of these modules and also attach it to the International Space Station. Uh, and then uh, it's going to be assembled while connected to the International Space Station, and then we'll separate upon its retirement. And I assume they meant the retirement of the ISS. Although, I suppose once the, their space station is done and ready to go, they could separate at that time. Uh, what you're looking at right now, that's one of the um, uh, crew compartments. So I actually think there's one more image, Dota, if you go down one. There you go. It gives you a slightly, like, that. that's your compartment. But the, the wow. cool thing, so in, in space, right, there's no up or down, so <laughs> you get to use all of the 3D space, so it is actually a little bit bigger than it seems. But what's interesting is you also get a giant window, because if I'm up in space, I'm yeah. just going to sit there with my head resting against the window, looking out at Earth like 23 out of 24 <laughs> of the hours, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So we've got, now let's see, we've got Bigelow Aerospace. Now we have Axiom. And uh, forgive me, I have forgotten the one that we just brought on the show. Yeah, Ryan Stan. Oh, Ryan Stan. We got Span. on the show not yep. too long ago. Yep. Then there's also the uh, the Ixion concept uh, uh, from NanoRacks and ULA to have the wet workshop reconverting uh, Centaur upper stages into uh, habitation modules. So I'm there's that saying, concept too. Space stations wow. are all the new hotness. They're all new rage right now. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, the thing about this one is, 
is um, they've got the people behind it, right? So they have former mission managers uh, of the ISS actually working this project. So they actually really know what they're doing from a uh, from a technology standpoint and from a uh, engineering based standpoint. Mm -hmm. the, I think the only thing up in the air right now is will they be able to fund it? Because spa space mm, is expensive, yeah. right? Yeah. So if they can get the funding necessary, uh, that's a really cool image of their, their awesome. version of the cupola. I, I'm curious as to how the engineering on that works because that's a lot of window. It's a lot of window. A lot of window in an environment that does not like window. But uh, again, you know, they have the engineering might behind this and they have the intelligence behind it. So there might be something there that I just don't know. And I, if you looked at one of the previous animations, there were these guards that kind of came down. Over I was going to say that maybe there's like a shield that comes over the windows yeah. and it comes up for like. Maybe they only tourism. open it up for a little bit yeah. and then close it so that you don't have micrometeoride yeah. uh, impact and whatnot. It, this okay. is interesting. And, and I think it's really cool that now not only do we have a bunch of launchers coming on the market. You've got SpaceX, Blue Origin, Rocket Lab is about to launch. They just made an announcement yes. that they're going to be launching again soon. Uh, and you know we've got others that are kind of in the wings. I forgot the last count, but it's over like 30 new space companies making launchers. Wow. Uh, it's a large number of people making launchers. So that's really cool. But now that we've got the launcher scene starting to come on the market, we're starting to see a shift over towards, okay, well, yes. now that we can get to space, what do we put into space? And we're starting to see space stations that, as that next step. So we've got space stations, and then we also have companies like uh, Deep Space Industries and uh, planetary resources that'll be mining objects in space. So you can start yes. to see this new space economy be born right before our eyes. It's just, it takes longer than you want. Yeah, yeah I mean, of course. Yeah, yeah but it's, but it's really, really quite cool. Yeah, and I like that you say like space economy because that just like dawned on me. I was like, oh yeah, wait a second. That's now going to be really starting mm -hmm. the, the whole next level mm -hmm. of, of what we have here on Earth as economy. And it's and even, I mean, think about it. What's the space currency going to be like? I mean, <laughs> I, mean that's, I think that's going to be really interesting. But, you know, I, that will come much, much later. Um, but yeah, when you start mining, like you're saying, mining asteroids and everything like that, like that's going to have a dollar sign on it. So it's just interesting. But of course, we like to, to not think so much like that, but more of, the, the, the science behind it and the, the beauty of the exploration. Uh, but that's just awesome. That, that's so yeah. cool. And I mean, everyone here, I love uh, the first comments I saw by Factor, bouncy stations, please. So, because one of the images, it looks like it was cushioned inside. Were those, yeah, yeah, those like uh, padding? Go, yeah, go back to the, uh, that, was, I think it's the, uh, the second the end image. There you go. Yeah, so that's your, uh, and you know, I, I didn't add it to my notes and I should have, but uh, this space station, Axiom, is actually being made and designed by a world-renowned architect. So Ooh. there's actual like design and style that's going into this. Oh, and, that's and awesome. I actually do think that's important. So it the, is. a lot of the engineers are like, that doesn't matter. It serves no engineering purpose. But you know what? If we're going to get people excited about going to space and living and working in space, it can't be cold and inhuman. Mm -hmm. It has to feel cool. It has to feel like something you want to live yeah. in. Now, you might look at this and go, I don't want to live in that, but that's just part part of the experience. Mm -hmm. And you know, notice it uses warm colors. It doesn't use the really cold stuff. And then it is kind of bouncy, so you can do like, it, it just, it looks kind of like fun. Like something yeah. that you would kind of, you kind of want to be there. And then like the, the cupola, again, it looks like fun. Yeah. They, they just make it look fun and cool and exciting. Yeah, it's like Instagrammable, so. Instagram. <laughs> do it for the that's, gram. That's the important <laughs> thing. That, that's the that's the takeaway of the space station. Can I, mean, I gram it? The future, yeah. The, the future, future is the can kids. I gram from space? <laughs> That's what we're coming Hashtag up with. build your own space station. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, that, that's Another, awesome. <laughs> yeah, if I Mike. can go off on just one more tangent on this too, yeah. um, there's the whole NASA Next Steps program, which is contracting out some bigger companies like uh, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Bigelow included, and now uh, uh, NGIS, the North of Front of Innovation Systems, to have habitats for like the lunar station and eventually habitats for large uh, Martian spacecraft when humans start making trips to, to, to Mars. So stuff like this that not only is functional, like it's great with the aesthetics as long as it works, you know, but having something that's functional and pleasing and comfortable is something that we very much need in the future. So I think that this is one of those steps of having these space stations because those same type of habitats is what we're going to use for the first missions to Mars. And I actually, yes. I think this might be that's an interesting I mean. round table in the future, which is more important, uh, the comfort comfort and the aesthetics or the engineering, like the, the usefulness of it, if that makes mm. sense. Um, right. And I think most engineers would be, well, obviously it has to be useful. They'd be like, it needs to be useful. But yeah. if it's useful and no one wants to go right. onto it, right. what's its purpose anymore? So yeah. there is something to be said for the design and the aesthetics, even if it serves no function, and even if it takes away from function and adds certain weight but makes it more desirable, maybe that is something that we need to be looking at. Right, because it would be consideration too, is just, when you're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm sorry, so we'll, we'll, yeah. No, it's 
It's okay. We'll do that in a round table. But a big consideration, too, is like the, the journey getting there. So many people are concerned about how, how cramped it is. A lot of times it is uncomfortable. Yeah. So when you r arrive to a space station, you do want it to be as comfortable as possible. So I think that that's a really good way to really like convince future you know consumers and buyers who are going to be purchasing these tickets to go um, to be like, you know, it's a little uncomfortable for like, you know, the 10 hours, however long it is, or maybe like four hours or, or you know, 18 months, wherever it is you're really going. Yep. Um, and then once you get there, this is what you're going to have on the other side. Okay. It's okay. So, yeah. But anyway, well, that's a great conversation. Uh, we're going to do a quick calendar break. And when we come back, Jared is going to be interviewing Kim Stedman from JPL. Stay tuned. Look into her face that to my nation in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or for a little fashion lies. Films on some expectation. This girl's a fascination. Welcome back. Before we get into our interview, we want to thank our Escape Velocity citizens. And we also want to acknowledge our Orbital citizens. And these citizens contribute $5 per episode or $15 per month. And if you guys would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And now, Jared is with Kim Stedman. Yes, and I am so, so excited because our guest this week is Kim Stedman, a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Welcome to the observation deck here at Station 204. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I'm glad you guys could have me. Yeah, and you know, we've got, there's a lot happening on Mars right now, uh, but we're not really going to start there because we kind of want to get to know you uh, before we before we start to talk about the things you've worked on and things like that. So tell us a little bit kind of just about yourself, your background, how you, how you got into engineering, where you decided to go to school and other things like that. Okay, I grew up in Georgia, and uh, if you want to be an engineer, and I always seemed to want to be an engineer since I was a small child, I was always interested in the space program and could would read everything I could get my hands on, watch everything, and, and so I wanted to be an engineer, and I didn't want to be an astronaut because that seemed kind of dangerous, and so I, and, and I was you know, almost legally blind, and so I didn't meet the criteria to be an astronaut, so I thought, well, the, if I can't be an astronaut, and I could be an aerospace engineer, and so I went to Georgia Tech, and I got my undergraduate and master's degree at Georgia Tech, and then I sent an email to Donna Shirley, who was uh, working on the Mars Pathfinder project, and I said, hey, you don't know me, but I would really like to come to JPL and work and be an engineer. And a miracle occurred, and they actually <laughs> called me and wanted me to come out to California and interview, and they hired me. And I've been there for 20 years now. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, so your first mission that you ended up working on was Cassini. Right. And uh, when did you come on to the Cassini project? When I came on to Cassini, they were just approaching Jupiter. Okay. So, and so we were still in cruise. 1999, I think. Yeah, yeah, 99. Think somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah so, um, so that was pretty early on in the mission with it. Well, to a lot of people, that was kind of late in the mission because a lot of people had already been working on Cassini for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so she took seven years to get out to Saturn. Because, first of all, it's a really long way, and to build a momentum, she went around the inner solar system, you know, a couple times, and then headed out to, uh, to Saturn. But we were very busy because we were, you know, we didn't have all of our software developed for operations because we were just passing Jupiter, yet Galileo was still at Jupiter, and there was all this scientific opportunity, and so we wanted to do joint science observations with two spacecraft. It, I mean, that was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And so we had to do a lot of work to make that happen while we're still working on how we're going to operate the spacecraft once she actually gets to Saturn for the primary mission. So you guys kind of, you kind of actually didn't have sort of the, the stuff that you needed for the primary right. mission. Ready tools, to go. Right. So, and you built that along the way to Saturn. Right. Because, I mean, you had four years after the flyby of Jupiter in yeah. order to get that together. It was just a, you know, that was a seven, we like, what, let's get the spacecraft built, get everything she needs on her, and get her out into space, and then we'll have seven years to prepare for operations and doing science. But, you know, scientists, there's scientific opportunities every day, and so they really wanted to do science on the way. And we had to just, like you do at JPL, you just make it happen. Yeah, and uh, figure and it out. I, I was going to say, you know, Ben was kind of talking about that earlier, which is JPL's kind of where the impossible actually happens. Um, that's kind of the cool thing about yeah. about JPL. Um, so, uh, during cruise, uh, is there anything you're doing besides building the operations when you're on your way? 
Well, we're building the operations, how we're going to operate it. And we actually started doing, because we knew what our trajectory was going to look like. We knew what the, the four-year tour was going to look like at some point. And so we just started integrating some science and trying to decide how we, you know, what we were going to do once we got there. And, of course, one of the first things we had planned on doing was dropping the Huygens probe. Mm -hmm. But then there's, Lisa talked about it, when Lisa Tadji, when she was here, about there was a problem that the Doppler shift was, was you know, bigger than had been anticipated. And so we actually had to carry the probe for a few more you know, journeys around Saturn before we let it go and sent it on to it, Titan. Interesting. So what was your role uh, during during the Cassini mission? Did did you have one role oh, during no. it or did it kind of evolve? Yeah, as I was there for 14 on? years. So uh, when I first started, I was what they call a mission planner. Mm -hmm. And so you deal with um, anything that affects several groups. Like we had the science office, we had the engineering office, and if something was cross-cutting across all of those, mm -hmm. then it fell under the purview of mission planning. Okay, so you're kind of like you're kind of like the the referee. Well, you're ca kind of, of the referee that doesn't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and then you also develop the mission plan, which everybody can go and read. That tells you exactly during the different phases of the missions what we're going to be doing. It gives guidelines and constraints about operations and things like that. And uh, you know, one of the things that we worked on in mission planning was the the dust. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of dust in the Saturnian system, and so when was it safe for our instruments to fly through this dust, and, and would we need to, to do anything extra to protect our, to protect our spacecraft? And mm -hmm. so that's one of the things we did. Interesting. Um, so, when you, so what was the arrival at Saturn like? Was it was, that, was totally insane. Kind of like nail-biting? Because, you know, you got to burn that engine or else it's off in the deep space Cassini well, goes. Well, right, yeah. We were either going to do a really great flyby or we were going to have this fabulous <laughs> mission at Saturn. And, and what we had, our, this was a critical sequence, so it was on board the spacecraft days before it executed. And so you're sitting there and you have all this energy, you have all this nervous energy, you're excited because you've been working so long and now you're finally going to get your science. And you can do nothing but just sit there and wait. And, uh, <laughs> and it was like over a 90 minute engine burn to slow the spacecraft down enough so she was captured in Saturn's orbit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, I understand on Mars, yeah, I did the Mars thing too, it's like six, six or seven minutes of terror. <clears throat> but this was like 90 minutes and you're like, oh, yay, the engine started because you're watching the Doppler plot. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have the little graph of the thing bouncing on Mars. You're just watching the Doppler. Oh, look, engine fired. Hmm. <sighs> now we just have to see when it's going to cut off. So then you go have some food and then you wait and you wait and you wait. And then, and then at the end, when the engine cuts off, you know you're there. Excellent. It was very exciting. I mean, there's just no way to say how exciting that was. It was probably the most exciting day I've ever had at JPL. And you stayed on after, uh, after oh, yeah. orbit insertion. Oh, yeah. You continued to work on the program. Oh, yeah, for, for a long time. Well, we were already in the extended, extended mission when I left. <laughs> so what were some of the highlights of working on Cassini? Because that was, you know, that was a, that's a flagship mission. That oh, yeah. Was, that was sort of a part of the 1980s Mariner Mark II mm -hmm. idea, which is that we're going to have these huge spacecraft going all over, uh, all over the solar system system, but Cassini ended up being like the only of those flagship uh, that ended up flying. Yeah, it was exciting, and especially at the beginning, we just, you know, we would, the scientists, like, um, when we did a flyby of Enceladus, and the magnetometer team came over from London and said, you know, we've seen some interesting data, the next time we fly by, could you change the trajectory so that we can see the moon with the southern part backlit by the sun, so mm. we can get some images because we think there's something interesting going on down there. And I was in that meeting, and I was like, oh, my gosh, what have we found? And then, uh, and then, you know, a few months later, when we flew by Enceladus again, and we got the first pictures of the plumes, and no one had expected that, and it was, it was just amazing. And Titan, you know, the first time we got to see below the clouds, because when the Voyager went by Titan, it's just this orange ball, and they could see nothing. Yeah. And so the first time we actually could see through the clouds and see down to the surface, it was very exciting. Wow, that, that's just uh, that's just kind of fantastic. I, I can, I can't even like imagine what seeing those Enceladus pictures was like. First off, because it was just mind blowing. Yeah, because that's like that's like an indicator of one of the critical things mm. that life needs. Actually, mm -hmm. like being there, you know, energy, an energy source generating right. something. So, uh, man, that's that is <laughs> so incredible. Um, so you also worked on something that Ben talked about in our news segment, which is opportunity. The yes, Mars I, rover opportunity. Yeah, I was actually on uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers for about a year before they launched. And then I rolled off back. I was half-time Cassini, half-time that for a while. Because <laughs> at JPL, if you have a, a mission that's coming up on a big critical event, it's kind of like a, you know, a black hole that just sucks the whole lab into it. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of get sucked in for a while. You do your job, and then you leave. And then years later, I went back to Opportunity and worked on the uplink team. And I was a tactical uplink lead, which is, means when you're 
a lot of people think that we joystick the rovers, you know, like if you watch the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. And that's not how we operate the rovers. <laughs> we all come into a nondescript little conference room and we spend, you know, six to ten hours building the sequences that are going to, is going to tell the rover what to do with herself for the next day or three. If it's a Friday, we plan three saws. And so for every minute of the day, she knows what she should be doing, whether she should wake up and, you know, do some science or drive or whatever. And so the uplink lead is in, kind of in charge of that process. And so I did that for a few years, and that was, that was absolutely fantastic. And I was there when, when we lost the flash memory, when we first saw the problems with the flash memory. Oh, uh, what, what, was the, what was that with Opportunity? Well, um, you know, our flash was very old, and uh, it just started doing every so often. We would try and write to flash, try and write, 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 and the rover would go, oh, I'm going to reboot myself because you've tried to do that too many times. So. <laughs> So, so you guys, so you guys are literally having to basically troubleshoot a computer from well, that's tens what we, of billions that's of what miles we do. Away. Yeah, I mean, with with all the spacecraft, you get a behavior that you don't expect. You have to try and figure out from here what's causing it and how to work around it. And so that's that's what makes this job great, mm -hmm. you know. And then, are there lessons that you guys learn from that that you integrate into future? Oh missions? yes, in fact, uh, the Cassini folks right now are working on. We call it. Lessons learned, shockingly enough. <laughs> and so, yeah, and then they'll, they'll have a, a document about their lessons learned. They'll also have briefings at JPL to the other team members, you know, people that don't work on Cassini, so that we don't, because we don't want to make the same mistake again. Mm -hmm. And you learn so much when you're operating these spacecraft. Yeah. And Factor in our chat room uh, is asking a question, what kind of modes does Opportunity have? Uh, is it just low power mode? Which, obviously, it's, it's a few more, mm -hmm. I would imagine, than low power mode. Well, I don't know exactly how many modes she has because we try and only operate her in nominal mode. So, so, so we have to us we have nominal and off nominal. Okay, so two modes. <laughs> and, and if it's nominal, we're very happy. If it's not off nominal, we're very, very, very busy and very unhappy. So, <laughs> so yeah. we like to be nominal. I imagine there's quite a lot of work that happens when when off nominal things are. Well, going right, on, and so. and you know, for right now, the team is is just preparing for you know what state could opportunity be in mm -hmm. when she comes back. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that because you know that that is what's happening to opportunity right, right now, and I, I know you're not currently working um, on opportunity, or are you? Did no, they no, like no. pull you back in? Oh no, no, okay. No, no. Yeah, I didn't know if it was like one of those things like you see in the movie where they're like, we're gonna we're gonna bring them back in. They're the well, expert, they they you know? do that because because yeah. um, opportunity and spirit were a 90 day mission. And so when things do go wrong, the documentation, you know, you try and keep up with your documentation as best you can. But if the person, if you're having flight software problems, you, then you go and you find the person who wrote that software, mm -hmm. and then you bring them in. So that happens all the time. Yeah, and in our chat room, Sarge Enzyme uh, has a really good question, which is kind of sort of leading into this, uh, which is, do you have a duplicate rover at JPL for solving problems? I believe you guys do. We do. We have a test bed. Mm -hmm. She's not an exact duplicate, but she is a test bed. Yeah. And so a lot of stuff, they go down to the test bed to test it before they ended up the rover. Same thing with Curiosity. Yeah, and it's a it's like a full scale, oh, yeah. same drives. mechanics and everything yeah, kind of test bed. Yeah. yeah, same weights as well, like you would have on Mars, or a little bit different? Uh, some stuff's missing, so it's not the exact, but it's as close as we can get it. And you guys use that to sort of just, do you guys use that for troubleshooting, or do you also use it for like, hey, let's find what the limit can be for, oh, for the vehicle? Oh, no, try not to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because once you reach the, you only know you reach your limit when you break things, and we try not to break things. Yeah, even on the even on Earth, I mean, I would imagine on Mars you're trying not to break well, things. Well, when you're building stuff and testing, then you do some of that, right? Yeah. But once you have your test bed rover, you don't want to break it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, the parts on the testbed rover, she's rather ancient, too. She's, you know, getting on in years, and so, you know, trying to get the parts to fix her would be bad. It would yeah. be so, difficult. So, so it might also, I mean, there's, I guess there's not only no spares on Mars, there's no spares on Earth as well. Well, we do have like some. That. Okay. But but not for everything. So gotcha. we Like, um, for curiosity and for opportunity, you don't want to break the arm. Yeah, and to uh, kind of piggyback on a question, Travis Neal from our YouTube chat room um, sort of wants to ask, uh, how long can Opportunity go without power uh, until it can't come back? It's so, a temperature question, not a mm -hmm. duration question. Um, right now we're very lucky that it's, it's summer on Mars, mm -hmm. and so it's warmer than normal. And so the, the trick with Opportunity is what everyone's worried about is how cold her electronics will get. Mm -hmm. If they get too cold, then they'll fail, and then when she won't wake back up. But yeah. if they don't, she could go. She could go for quite a while. Yeah, but there's also there's heaters on board, right? But that draws heat. power, right? So, um, and I was also reading somewhere that there's instruments on board that you could just leave on, and they'll generate heat as well. 
but that also draws power. That's that's a problem. So yeah. there's like a real like delicate balancing act that you have to go with making sure right. to keep opportunity alive. Right. And there's a brilliant woman that works at JPL named Jennifer Herman. And she is in charge. Of, she's the power engineer on opportunity. And she works on curiosity, too. And she tells everybody what, what the rover needs to survive. So she's kind of she's kind of calling the shots right now. With, well, with for the, kinda... from the power oh, point okay. of view, she is. Mm -hmm. She gives her recommendations, and then yeah. of course, you know, the managers decide. Gotcha. So, like, what kind of what would be ha or what is happening at JPL right now? If you do know, is there like a, like a like is are all of the teams sort of coming together and and sitting down every day? Like, are are they like Apollo thirteening it, or they're like twenty four seven on no. call with that? <laughs> no, <laughs> not quite. They were coming in because. Um, when we didn't know what mode she was in, mm -hmm. when if she's in the safe mode, then she would wake up every so often for what we call system fault protection windows. And that's an op so you know at what time she's going to wake up and you try and send her a command. And so I think that they're still sending her a command that says, please send us a beep. Mm -hmm. but, um, but other than that, they're just going through their procedures of what to do when she wakes up. Yeah, and uh, we've got a question. There's, there are so many questions from our chat room. Um, about power, so I'm just going to try to consolidate them as best I can um, here, which there's one from Sir Game -A -Lot that says, can the wings be lifted up so that they can catch less dust in the storm? Um, I think he's, I think they're talking about yeah, uh, the solar the panels, because they had to actually unfold right. uh, back, and I, I don't know if there's another motor to no, go no, backwards with that. No, we can't move that. those. And you know, it's not the, right now, it's not the dust on the solar panels that we worry about, it's the dust in the air. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much dust in the air that no sunlight is getting to opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, she will probably be a little dustier than she was before, but that's not our main concern. Our main concern is the storm clearing so that there will be enough sun hitting opportunity so that she can get enough power to wake back up. Yeah. And AD from our YouTube chat is asking, why isn't there a system to clear dust from solar panels? Because, <laughs> <So, laughs> I mean, it is one of those things that, like, oh, this is such a simple idea, but it's significantly more complicated than Well, that. right, because if you're, you know, the, the, the deck of opportunity, you've seen pictures of it, it's not completely just blank. It's not just mm -hmm. the solar panels that are there. There's other things. And she was sent there to do science, not to clean herself off, and she was, you know, sent for a 90-day mission. So but that's just not something that was ever considered because I... That would be very difficult and would add more mass. Yeah, and uh, Tarantula in our chat room is asking, how does the Mars, the current dust event or the current dust storm that's occurring on Mars, um, compare to the circumstances that put Spirit out of commission? Well, a dust storm didn't get Spirit. She um, she got stuck, mm -hmm. and winter came before she could get unstuck, and that's how she lost her power mm -hmm. because it just got too cold, and she wasn't in a good enough tilt, and it just you know, yeah. it's just not the same thing. Now, what was it, 2000, oh gosh, someone's gonna be very angry at me, 2007, when the, we had the last dust yes. storm and Opportunity mm -hmm. did go to sleep? Yeah. So, back then, the tau, which is the measure of the opacity of the, you know, the atmosphere, was at like 5.5, and the higher you get, the less sunlight you see. And so, usually on a nominal day, she's around 0.7, maybe one. Uh, Curiosity, I think, is at 2.5 right now. And back in that storm, I think the highest they saw was 5.5 .5 on a Tau. And mm -hmm. this time they've seen like 10.8. Mm -hmm. So there's just no comparison. It's it's huge. Yeah, I was reading somewhere that even going back to Viking data. This they is saw like, nine. They saw is, a Tau of nine. This is like the the most yeah, we've, significant event we've seen. Since we've had assets on Mars yeah. that were working, this is the worst that we've ever seen. Yeah, and uh, holy moly. And it's and as far as I understand, it's getting bigger, too. It's, yes, it's spreading. Yeah. yeah. So Because on uh, Curiosity, because we're kind of on the other side of Mars, and so we've been watching because we take pictures off in the distance mm -hmm. and then we compare them and you can really see uh, the pictures coming from Curiosity now, you can just see the dust in the air. Mm -hmm. And also we've noticed we have no shadow yeah. because there, enough of the sun is blocked that now in the afternoon we have no shadow. Yeah, that's, that's intense. <laughs> well, it's pretty weird to look at when you look at a picture on the right side that was taken two days ago and the one on the left side taken about the same time of day. And we haven't moved because we've been drilling. Mm -hmm. And there's just suddenly no shadow. And you're like, well, that's weird. Yeah, that's not good. Um, and Curiosity is not going to be particularly affected by the dust storm. No, right? not power-wise at all. So, yeah, I was, I was hearing that the optics on Curiosity may actually be affected by the dust we storm. We worry about so. that. And... Um, so like we have the Mars hand lens imager that actually has a, a dust cover on her. Mm -hmm. And so in this kind of, of situation, if it gets bad enough, we just would not open that dust cover. Mm -hmm. And then for the mass cam, you worry about that too. Yeah. 
And um, we got a, a re really good question from our YouTube chat room from uh, Dan Thomas Commons, uh, which is, do you and other JPL engineers develop some sort of attachment to the rovers that you work with? Oh, yes. Um, and, I, I, <laughs> and they're also asking about decommissioning Cassini, because that that just happened in September of mm -hmm. last year. Uh, so. What, what is it like? Do you, you guys get attached to them? Or they, oh, absolutely, you, because you work so hard for them to make sure they're happy and they're functioning, and, and they give you such you know, satisfaction when you see the images come down and the science results. And, and, and it's amazing. They, they, you know, they, I don't know if it's family, but we, we really feel a lot for our spacecraft. Do you, so. sort of, do you sort of feel like they all have their own personalities oh, yeah, they do. as well? They absolutely do. What, what are, can, you t can you tell us about some of the personalities? Well, it's just, you know, like... It was spirit and opportunity. Opportunity was like, here, I've landed on Mars, and I'm going along. Oh, look, here's my science stuff, everything. So, you know, right here, right in front of me, and spirit, where she landed, she didn't see exactly what we were looking for, and so she had a much rougher time. She had uh, more failures, mechanical failures, earlier in the mission. And, uh, and so she was just like the plucky rover who could do anything no matter what happened. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, so Spirit was sort of like the rover down on her luck, but she yeah. still, she still, still did what she was supposed attitude, to do. Still positive attitude, still loving yeah. life, yeah. And opportunity was like, this is easy going, and I'm, yeah. I'm still, I'm just, everything's right in front of me, and I'm, I'm the golden kid, if you and will, And she's like, like, oh, that. this, this actuator isn't working any longer? No problem. I can still go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, MSL is like, ow, my feet hurt. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit, yeah. a little bit later down um, in there. So um, the, the question came from Ben sitting over there, uh, which is what's MSL like uh, or curiosity. So uh, that was that was pretty funny. Um, so Factor uh, has a really good question, which is something that I'm interested in, um, which is how is how does Opportunity clean its solar panels? Are there any top secret methods or methods, or do you just find wind to blow it off? Well, what we do is in the, the, the room where we may plan all of uh, the sequences for her, the tactical room, we have a little model of opportunity. And when she gets really dusty, we take this little ninja and we put it on top of the rover <laughs> and we hope that the ninja gods, the dust ninja gods will hear us and we hope to get a cleaning event, mm -hmm. which can either be some wind that blew the, the dust off or one of those dust devils that comes across her. And that, that's all we can do. <laughs> and you've had cleaning events before. Oh, oh yes. Yep. It, and it's very dramatic, too, because you'll come in. When I was on Opportunity, you come into work one day, you have 350 watt hours coming out of the, the, the solar panels. And you're getting to close to where, you know, oh, you know, power's kind of limiting what we can do during the day. And then you come in the next day and you have 600 watt hours. And you're like, hmm. Mm -hmm. Cleaning event, that was nice. And so <laughs> then you use the mask cam to take pictures of the deck to confirm how clean you are. And it's dramatic. Yeah. It's dramatic. It really looks like someone did come in overnight and clean her up. Mm -hmm. So when you get a good one. Yeah, and uh, Tarantula in our chat room uh, also is asking about ultrasound vibrators. Is that kind of a viable option for future rovers? Um, uh, there, I, I guess they were experiments to replace window wipers um, on those there, but I don't <laughs> think any of the rovers at least coming up, are, or any of the planned rovers are going to be solar powered. No, the only rover we have on the books right now that we're building at JPL right now is the, is the Mars 2020 rover, which is based off Curiosity. Yeah, and we're, we'll actually get into both of those rovers yeah. um, in just a little bit um, with that there, because I still want to ask about opportunity, um, because we have a couple more, couple more questions uh, uh, from it, Solomon uh, Wykolposki from our YouTube channel. Sorry, Solomon um, is asking, what language is Opportunity software written in, and what sort of processor does it have? It's a rover markup language that we created. Okay, so it's like your own RML. custom language. Yeah. So, so the rover talks the language we taught her. Okay. Wow. All right. And I don't so. remember what kind of processor she has. Yeah, I know it's it's yeah, probably that up. <laughs> it's probably like radiation hardened. Yeah, so it's, it's a rad something. Yeah. So <laughs> that'd be pretty interesting. Uh, so Vogon is asking, which rover do you love the most? Well, you can't pick one. <laughs> that'd be rude. Yeah. And if they heard you, they can't hear you. Uh, I don't know. Well, I've always said I would not bet against opportunity no matter what. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's a good rate. That's, yeah. I'm not going to disagree with that uh, at all. So um, kind of moving on from opportunity to curiosity, the, uh, the next big one uh, that landed in 2012, uh, what, did, what did you do with curiosity? Well, when she first landed, I just watched and was glad I wasn't on Mars time. Because I was still, I was, and, and then now, now I do the same job that I did when I was on opportunity. I'm an uplink lead. 
Mm -hmm. And so. Uh, so you're still kind of mission planning and things like that as the well, right? Right, systems engineer. So. Um, mm -hmm. And and the tolls are responsible for like when new activities are going to go up to the to the rover and be executed. We we run a little process um, called STAG to make sure don't, it's an acronym. Don't remember what it stands for, um, but it's an activity. It's tactical activity gate. So that's what it is. And so for. So we get all the people in that, that built the new process, like our, our new drill uh, the procedures, that the way we're drilling now, because you know the feed doesn't work yes. anymore. So you have to use the. If I remember, we're right, doing feed pushing the arm yes, down. Yes, we're doing feed so. extended <laughs> drilling using percussion, better known as fed up. So, <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, so before that can actually come and be put oh, in a plan and go up to the rover, it has to be approved, and so that's one of our strategic uh, things that we do. So yeah, it's really mission planning, I and, guess, in a way. And kind of, what's the differences between oper uh, operating opportunity and operating curiosity? Well, curiosity is a lot more complex. There's a lot more instruments. Um, she weighs a lot more, and. Um, it's just uh, the complexity is just ratcheted up. Yeah, I mean this. So we many have a, levels. Yeah, we have an image up of the end of the uh, the arm. Oh there yeah, the turret. All, all yeah. those tools on board, and that's like I think one side of those has as many uh, instruments on it as as Opportunity had in its entirety. And I think it also weighs as much as Opportunity. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a bit of so, a yeah. bit of a step up there <laughs> with it. So. So yeah, before we even deploy the arm, we have to do. Uh, slip risk assessment process mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, when we deploy the arm because it's such a change in the mass, mm -hmm. that, you know, that if we're up on, if the wheels are up on a rock that they won't, you know, tip down, fall off the rock and crash the arm into the ground. Yeah, and you just, you, 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 I, I mean, you can't put curiosity in like four low or no. anything like that, right? You gotta, no. you gotta make sure that it's, that it's well set. Right. There's enough traction to keep it there. Yeah, before um, we deploy that arm, we have to make sure that it's not gonna shift and cause damage to our arm. Yeah, and we've actually got the wheels up uh, up here, kind of looking at them. Oh, but uh, these are right beautiful there. wheels. Awesome. Yes. There's no holes in these wheels. Those are fresh wheels, yeah. but we do have an image, because um, you were talking, oh yes, of course. The, That's uh, even cleaner wheels in the cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is the, the Morse code that uh, oh, yeah. is famously on the uh, the wheels there that spell out JPL. So, yeah, they uh, even made a shirt with that on it. <laughs> nice. We'll have to get that. Actually, I think, uh, oh, on my old laptop, uh, I had that as a sticker yeah. on there. So not on my new one. I yeah, guess I need to, cool. need to go back to JPL and get some stickers. Uh, um, but you were talking about how, what's curiosity like, ow, my feet. Yeah. Um, I th this next image, I think, kind of says it all yep. there with one of them. Yeah. Uh, kind of what's, what's going on with curiosity? Well, as far as the wheels are concerned, we have a lot of people that work many, many hours. So when we drive far enough, then we do what we call full molly wheel imaging. And so thankfully, because of the way that Spirit failed, because uh, one thing you couldn't do with Spirit is look underneath the rover. Mm -hmm. And so now we can look underneath the rover. We can use that, the molly at the end of the arm, and we can just do, well, you've seen the selfies. Yes. We can do the selfies, but we also do a wheel inspection. Mm -hmm. So we'll take a picture of the wheels, the rover will roll up, a little bit, we'll take more pictures so we get to see the full wheel. And every time we do that, then these engineers go off and they count all the cracks and all the, you know, the holes and stuff and measure if they've gotten bigger or not. And uh, and then we just drive a lot more careful. Yeah. You know, we really pick and choose our drive path, well the rover planners do, and they make sure that we're not, you know, not only for safety, but for wheel wear. Mm -hmm. And so, instead of going here, which is, you know, it's faster, but if we go over here, there's less wheel wear. We'll do that. And so we're really managing that as much as we can. So it's very strategic now in driving oh, curiosity. Yeah. It's not so much the the monster trucking that was, I mean, relative monster trucking that well, was well, happening Well, as relative as you get. So. It's not like just go over there and pick your own way, have fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which we have done, uh, mm -hmm. but now it's very nitpicky. And uh, some of the terrain that we've seen on Mars with curiosity was just, I mean, I, when we were in the Knockleaf Plateau, I mean, I looked at the pictures on like, I don't think anybody thought a place like this existed that we would need to drive in because the jagged rocks were just yeah, I mean, amazing. It's, it's eaten up the wheels. Oh, so yeah. I mean, it's and and is that like is that the primary concern right now? Well, that was with, with wheels. That? No, that was with wheels. But right now, we don't think the wheels are going to limit our mission. Okay. Because we've got that under control. We mm -hmm. monitor it. We have meetings all the time about it, and so that's pretty good, much under control. And then the next thing that hit us was the failure of the feed mechanism on the drill. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, we had the stabilizers, you put the stabilizers down on the ground, and then you would feed the drill out and drill in, and so you just didn't have to worry about, you know, damaging the arm or the drill bit walking or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And when our feed um, declined to work when we commanded it, 
Um, we had to figure out a new way to drill. The first thing we'd had to do was get the feed fully extended. So the drill, I don't know if you have pictures of it, but the drill is now completely out, as far mm -hmm. out as it can go. Yeah, and we, so, we, we actually talked about that uh, in a previous episode in our news segment. Oh, well, great, good, uh, good. So yeah, we, yeah, we included the images of, of the, the drill as it was and the mm -hmm. feed drill now completely out. So and that that's a really, really cool. good example of what we use the test bed for. Mm -hmm. Maggie, our test bed rover, um, they, they did all the drill, you know, to figure out this fed process. They, they tested everything up there. Mm -hmm. She has an identical drill and they would bring in different kind of rocks and try and drill and see what worked and stuff because now the arm has to stabilize itself. Mm -hmm. And so they had to figure out how to do that. So uh, Destructor 1 has a, has a really good question, which is do the limitations and cautions imposed by the environment and the delicacy of the rovers, does that ever frustrate you? Um, Mars is hard. <laughs> and so I don't think frustrate is the right word. Um, I find it exciting to, you've got a rover, uh, she's on Mars, she's splunking around, and, and you know, sooner or later something's gonna break. Mm -hmm. Just like you drive your car around here. Yep. So one day you're gonna go in and you're crank it up and nothing's gonna happen. And well, it's easy, you call your mechanic, and we can't do that. We have to try with what we have on the rover to figure out what's wrong, mm -hmm. and um, how catastrophic is this failure, and what is the workaround. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, if we can, because we've just drilled and we delivered sample to Sam and Kim in. So while the drill was broken, you basically had two science instruments sitting there that couldn't do a whole lot. And so now that we can drill and deliver sample to them, well, we're back in business. Yeah, and, and so. Curiosity's uh, delivering samples right, and yeah. going with it, so. Absolutely. Uh, so Dutta has a question, which is, what are the different usage cases for using which test rover? Uh, you have Scarecrow as well for what, and I believe that uh, Scarecrow was a... She's a mobility test bed. Yes, so, so, do you, so what are the different test beds and what do you use each specific test bed for? Well, gosh, we have, um, we have a test bed that's just computers, and so if you can test it there, that's what you do. And if you actually need to do the rover, then, then we'll go to Maggie. But for some of the, uh, yeah, some of the mobility, you'll use Scarecrow. But we don't use Scarecrow as much. What we've done um, for 2020, you know, they have new wheels because mm -hmm. the problem with Curiosity that, that everybody knows about is the wheels. So now we have new wheels. Well, to test those wheels, they just set up a test bed and put an arm out there with a wheel and just ran it in a circle for like months <laughs> over the, the, all these obstacles to make sure that it wouldn't be an issue. Gotcha. And so when we know what we need to test, then we'll decide where to test it. And, uh, and it also depends on what fidelity you need because we can run um, simulated flight software from our computers. And if that's all we're worried about, we just sit in our computer and do it. And then we go to the bigger test bed that's not actually the rover and run more, f get higher fidelity. And then if we actually want to move or see how the instruments respond while we're moving the arm or anything like that, or if we need to drill, then we'll go to Maggie. Gotcha. And Hanny's Vorwerp from Twitch is asking, is there a dedicated MacGyver group that handles unique situations that unexpectedly occurred, like the like the drill problem? Is, so you guys have like a group of people that are like like they can you know they can make a lock pick out of a, out of just in, things they have laying around on their no on that their would desk. be kind of nice no but. <laughs> So different groups, uh, like we have the engineering office and they own uh, all the engineering hardware on Curiosity. And so if we have a problem that's an engineering problem, like with the, the data processing system on there or the computer or anything, then they work on that. And it's just the people that do the regular operation of the rover. And for the drill, anything that moves, if it's on the arm or it's a mobility thing, that's the rover planner group. And so they're the, they're the ones that have been working that. They do bring in specialists, people who help design the arm, people who design the drill, people who have done some of the flight software. They'll bring them in to consult or even help on the problem. Mm -hmm. But no, it's just the people who regularly operate the rover. They, when it breaks, you figure out how to fix it. Yeah, so you, you don't call the, the group to come in because <laughs> they, they wouldn't know your rover. Yeah. Because so each rover and each scientific instrument has what we call idiosyncrasies. So you thought it worked like this, but it really kind of does this. And so if uh, a group that wasn't familiar with it came in, they go, well, this is wrong. Well, no, 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 she, she's been doing that since day one. Mm -hmm. And so the people that live with the rover have to try and fix her. Yeah. So St. Alex uh, has a good question, which I really like, which is, are there any experiments that use data from both opportunity and curiosity uh, to check on the abilities of each other? So To check on the abilities of each other? Or maybe also just in general, I, I guess to kind of expand well, you, on the well, you've got Yeah, you've got um, science coming from one side of Mars and science coming from the other. So, mm -hmm. sci so the scientists, there are scientists out there that will use data from both, absolutely. Yeah. And then they don't just use data from both, they use data from the orbiters, like MRO and Odyssey and 
all those. Yeah. So you know, you, yeah. you check check from the ground to make sure that the assets in orbit are are, I guess, correct. Well, I mean, so. you know, we've got so many you know spacecraft at at Mars that to get the full picture, you you need everything. Mm -hmm. And MRO also helps us because you know she images Mars, and that's how we plan our strategic route where we're going to drive mm -hmm. is by the image images that we get from her and the data too. Because she'll say, there's an interesting stuff over here. Look at this result we've got. And then we'll go, let's go look and see what that looks like on the ground. Yeah. So Tawicket has a, a, a question, more a request, or maybe even a demand, um, which is, can we get to 2020 already? So here you are, Internet, where we aim to... We're not ready. Yeah. <laughs> we're just not ready for that yet. <laughs> yeah, we're still 18 months away from uh, 2020 to Wicked. So, um, but uh, obviously 20, Mars 2020 is the next rover. Mm -hmm. um, and you are working on that. Right, yes. I'm on the science operations team and the mission systems group. And so I'm helping to uh, create the process of by which we're going to operate the rover. Mm -hmm. And uh, to kind of kind of talk about this, because this is a subject that always comes up um, when we talk about this, and I believe Mars 2020 is finally going to have a solution um, to this, which Citizen 15775 is saying, how come there is no microphone on the rover to hear Mars? Well, when you're, you know, you only have so much mass you can put up there, and mm -hmm. people, the scientists, you know, they propose all these instruments, and we can only take so many. But mm -hmm. now we're going to have a microphone. Yeah, and what, like, what are what are they going to hear with the microphone? You guys have any ideas as to what I they're going to hear? I don't. I think it's pretty cool, though. Yeah, I like. I, I would imagine wind. Yeah, I you'd think you hear, hear wind. wind. You'd hear the rover itself. Yeah, the, the like the arm moving. And yeah, the and, and, and the things. crunching of the wheel. Well, that, <sighs> that would be so <laughs> that cool. Would be really cool. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be really cool. Oh, oh yeah, maybe yeah. we uh, maybe we don't want to hear. Yeah, we could. I mean, we could hear the sound of the wheels uh, going over, and from the crunching, you could figure out the. I've heard the test bed rover driving around, and you're like, oh, yeah. What are the wheels? What are the they're wheels aluminum. made out of? Aluminum. Yeah. They're okay. Anodized aluminum. Are Mars 2020's wheels going to be aluminum as well? Yes, but they're much different. In fact, I sent you guys a picture of the wheels. Okay. Yeah. We actually. This is sort of a. a yeah. There she is. Image. There's your wheels. Yeah. Yeah. And what's what's the difference on these wheels between well, Curiosity's these wheels? These wheels aren't as wide as Curiosity. Because they can't really have more mass than Curiosity. Because, because mm -hmm. when we land, of course, you know, when we're when the rovers are on their way to Mars, they're kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And then on the way, when they go down the bridle, then the wheels and the arms pop out, mm -hmm. and so that creates a lever arm. And if you they weigh too much, you're going to snap your arm off. And so we don't want them to weigh anymore. So what they did was they made them thinner, but thicker. And you can see that um, we have the, what they call the grousers, the little jagged things. So they have a lot more of those, and they're wavy. And uh, so they spent a lot of time and a lot of, you know, effort to make sure that these wheels would be able to drive wherever we landed. Yeah. And Hanny Zwerwerp from Twitch asks, how do, you, how do you plan out the design of a new planetary rover? How many stakeholders are involved in that? Like, oh, my gosh. Like, what's, what's it like trying to figure out what you're going to do on Mars? Well, first you have to, uh, you have the rover. And so the, the proposal for Mars 2020 was that it would, you know, rely on MSL design as much as it could, the Curiosity rover. And so there's a lot of things you wouldn't have to reinvent, reinvent. You wouldn't have to design a rover from scratch. But then you put the proposal out there or the announcement of opportunity for the science instruments. You say these are science goals and then people bid, you know, that well, they, they propose their instruments and then NASA selects the instruments. And I that process just that's magic to me <laughs> and then and then you have to accommodate those instruments mm -hmm. like where, what do they need because they'll need internal electronics to go into the body of the rover and they'll have stuff positioned all over the rover what do they need mm -hmm. and then you have to try and make that work and that's that's very complicated. Yeah, that's a that's a dance, I would imagine, um, yeah. and a very careful one at that. Uh, Johnny Boy has a question. We're going to go back to the wheels uh, real quick because everyone's everyone's just uh, it's like well, the pictures are spectacular. Yeah, it's the early two thousands, so everyone wants good wheels on their things. So um, Johnny Boy's asking, why not use titanium for the wheels? Are there are there mass considerations for oh, that? Oh, there's always mass considerations. Yes, you want to use the lightest thing you possibly can because mm -hmm. you have to get it off Earth. Mm -hmm. And that, <laughs> yeah, that's and for every pound, you, you know, you're limited. And so if you mm -hmm. put more mass in your wheels, you're, you're going to take off a science instrument, perhaps. It's always a trade, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they designed the wheels for Curiosity, the experience we had was with Spirit and Opportunity. And what happened to Spirit and Opportunity? They kept getting stuck in sand. Mm -hmm. And so these wheels were designed to hopefully go better over sand. Mm -hmm. And um, we just didn't expect some of the terrain that we got. Mm -hmm. And uh, Johnny from Twitch is asking, are the new wheels 3D printed? No. No? <laughs> so they're from a single block kind of thing? I don't think they're, no. 
Yeah. So are, are any components on board of Mars 2020 going to be 3D printed? I don't know. So Could be, because they, the, they have some fancy machining uh, things now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not Yeah, sure. I've been in the shop at JPL, and there's some, like, there are some things it's in there. It's massive. But that, the wheels aren't made at... Uh, I don't think the wheels are made at JPL. I don't know who's making the wheels. Oh, okay. Somebody out there will know yeah. and tell you who's making the wheels. Yeah, so yeah, if somebody in the comments will uh, do yeah. it, and next week we'll, we'll pull it up um, in our, in our, our yeah. third section of the show. Uh, ben is asking, why not use unobtainium for the wheels? Yeah, we tried to use that, but they used it for all his Marvel movies, so <laughs> we're out of luck. Uh, so uh, Vokan's asking, is Mars 2020 the biggest rover yet? Uh, it should be the most massive, for sure. Okay. So a little heavier than Curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her so. turret weighs more than Curiosity. I think her body weighs more than Curiosity. Okay, and Astro YYZ is asking, is the EDL for Mars 2020 going to be like Curiosity? So exactly. EDL being entry, descent, and landing. Yeah, it'll be exactly like it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it will work as well. Yes. There's, there was, there's, is there doubt or is there? Well, you know, whenever you go to Mars, Mars is difficult. Mars sometimes punishes you for even trying to come and visit her. <laughs> so... You know, when you launch, I think the scariest time for a mission is launch. Mm -hmm. Because you have no control. You've, you've spent all this time building your spacecraft, and then you, you hand her to someone else and says, please, please put her up into space. And, and then, you know, these rockets are, are just huge, and there's so much propellant in them, and, mm -hmm. and it's nerve-wracking. Will she get up there? Will the payload fairing separate? Will everything work so that she's exactly where we need her? And then the, the second scariest time is um, either orbit insertion, for an orbiter, or landing for, for a lander. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just that's where most things are going to go wrong if something's going to go wrong. Yeah. And they're the most complex, pro and they're the most unforgiving. If we're just driving along and something goes wrong, the rover can stop. If mm -hmm. something goes wrong during EDL, there, that's it's, it. It's a big, game over. It so, could be. Yeah. So, um, and Lance is asking: Is the mass limit due to the sky crane? Is that kind of the consideration? Oh, no, it's for a launch it? vehicle. Oh, the launch vehicle. Got to fit inside the launch vehicle. Okay. And is Mars 2020 doing an Atlas V again? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Atlas V in the 541 configuration. I so think so, yes. Five meter payload fairing, four solids, and a single engine Centaur upper stage. So um, fun stuff. <laughs> fun stuff. So, and that answers uh, Sarge Enzyme's uh, question, which is who's launching the 2020 rover? Uh, United Launch Alliance with yep. their, their Atlas V, I guess, same flavor of rocket that Curiosity. I think so, yeah. Uh, I know it's an Atlas V. Flew on. So um, yeah, really, really cool stuff. Uh, Tarantula is asking, um, you know, sorry if I missed it, but is there going to be a name for the 2020 rover? Over. Yes. Um, do you know how the rovers are named? Uh, usually they go ask school, like they have school kids propose them, right? Yes, they have the school children propose them and it's a contest and mm -hmm. so they'll write an essay on the name and uh, why they think that's a good name and then uh, there'll be a selection process and, so, and then there'll be a winner and that last time for Curiosity, I think the girl who won actually got to come to JPL and visit uh, Curiosity in the 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 what is that called, where we build them? Oh, the, the spacecraft. The high bay. And the spacecraft high bay. assembly facility? Yeah, in the high bay. Yeah. And the That's clean room. That's it. That's what I was looking for. Clean there room. There you go. And so I think she actually got to sign her name. Wow. On and the so, rover? I think so. And, oh. and, that, and that's next year. Next year for March 2020. Okay, I'm a little jealous uh, yeah. of a child now. Um, <laughs> so, um, Shiny Pulsar Star Can you sign is. Our name? Uh, mm -hmm. we'll go to I don't even get to sign my name. Yeah, I don't. I don't think. They don't even let the engineers sign their names. We wouldn't do that. Oh, I'm sure so you would. JPL and Morse so. code on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's different. Um, you don't autograph your children, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> Uh, so Shady Pulsar Star uh, is saying that they're nervous about the sample return part of Mars 2020, which is uh, the caching, or the caching of, uh, of things. Um, we've never sent a tiny tube from a planet back to Earth. Um, so kind of tell us a little bit a about what's tube. going on with that. Well, we have a nice sample caching system that's going to be on our rover. And so what we're going to do is in one or two depots, we'll make all our samples and we'll drop them in the depot and then hope something else will go and get them and bring them back. They won't come back on their own through space. Okay, so we're gonna have to send another mission yes. to go back and pick these things up. And go and collect them. And bring them back and then yeah. launch them, which is scary. Um, yes, very and then, scary. And then have them do EDL on Earth, which I guess is another scary bit. Um, yeah, but we're, we're, we've done that a lot more. Okay, yeah, fair enough. We've, we're, yeah. we're used to that, so yeah. We, so. yeah. 
we're, we're, we're moderately okay at it. Yeah. So uh, now to my kids asking, uh, what instrument would you like to see on a Mars rover that hasn't been sent to Mars yet and is currently being and isn't currently being planned to be sent? Oh wow, that's a good question. What would you What would you want to send? I guess I don't really know. I mean, my favorite are the the ones that take the really pretty pictures. The yeah. cameras, yeah, I mean, that's my favorite. Yeah, that's it's, some cool stuff. Yeah, so. and the cameras just keep getting better and better, and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, do you know some of the instruments that are going to be on Mars 2020? Yeah, um, and I pause and my brain dies, but um, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, all the instruments have been selected and they're being built, uh, they're being actually delivered at, later in this year, and we'll start actually putting them in the rover. But uh, we have, of course, cameras, we have MassCam Z. Our MassCam mm -hmm. is Z, MassCam Z because it has a zoom. Which oh. the mass cam on uh, Opportunity and Curiosity does not. So we'll have, a, we'll have some of the same things. We'll have a navigation camera. We'll have has cams. We'll have uh, RimFax, which will hang off the back of the rover, which is really cool. And it, it's, it's a radar that'll look in, a ground penetrating Ooh. radar. And so it'll do that. And then we have Pixel and Sherlock, which are really weird acronyms, but um, they're <laughs> on the end of the rover. And instead of like Curiosity does um, what we call contact science. She actually mm -hmm. touches the rocks and we'll be doing proximity science because now our instruments, the kind of spectrometers they are, we just hover above uh, the rocks and then what they'll be looking for uh, together, Pixel and Sherlock, is uh, biosignatures. Oh. So if you see any, we're looking for proof that there was once life on Mars. Okay, so th is that going to be like a like definitive thing or? Well, they're looking for uh, things that can only be formed in the rocks the only way you can explain them being there is because life was there. Oh, and so that's so they call that a biosignature. Oh, okay, so, so we're yeah. we're kind of getting down to the uh, the yes or a, a like actual yes or no. Well, you know, um, we build because um, so. the Mars exploration rovers were follow the water. What's the history of water on Mars? Yes. And then Curiosity is like we're landing in Gale Crater. Was Gale Crater ever habitable? Mm -hmm. Could it have ever had life? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now that we know that then the Mars 2020 rover, let's go look for biosignatures. Gotcha. And, and, you know, see if we can take that next step and see what So it's a very is. methodical way that you right. move forward. It's, it's very, because very planned you, out. You build on what you already know. Yeah, you want each, I guess Sojourner was sort of like, can this work? You know, Pretty much. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then you kind of just go with, we know this, so let's go to the next step. Yeah, that was uh, a scientific path. Yeah. We need to know yeah. this. Oh, now we need to know this, and now let's mm -hmm. look for that. Because if you look for this before you know this and this, you, you could just be wasting your time. Yeah. Uh, and Destructor1701 is asking about what kind of upgrades uh, uh, Mars 2020 is going to have in ter in, compared to Curiosity. So what are some of those things? Well, the one thing is the wheels that I showed you guys, mm -hmm. or that you showed. And um, we have a helicopter. Yes. That's a demonstration. I just, it just got funded, too. Yeah, so. yeah, we've known about it for a while, but we didn't know if it was like a go. And mm -hmm. so I just got the official go to fly uh, on the Mars 2020 rover. And what that's for, it's, a, it's also a demonstration. Mm -hmm. um, it's a technology demonstration. But what, what it would do for us is a lot of times how far we can drive is limited by how far we can see. Mm -hmm. And so if we're an undulating you know, surface and we can't see very far, or there's a hill in front of us, then instead of being able to like drive 100 meters, we have to drive 10 meters up to this hill. And then, because at the end of every drive, we take post-drive imaging. And that post-drive imaging is how we plan our next drive. And so we can only drive what, where we can see. Mm -hmm. And if there's enough divot, enough missing information, then we can't drive there. And so if you had a helicopter that could go up, they could see the whole terrain. They mm -hmm. could see a lot further. And that's, that's what it's hoping to demonstrate. Is first of all, that you can have a helicopter flying on Mars, which would be really amazing. And then second of all, that it could work with the rover. Yeah. And Corkspin is asking, has there been a landing site selected for the Mars 2020 no, rover? No, they're down to three. And I think, uh, I don't know when the next landing workshop is. It's sometime this summer, maybe July. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully they'll come down to one then, but that's no guarantee, but hopefully. Yeah, and then after that, they've got to they kind of duke it out a little bit. You know, I want this landing site. No, I want this well, landing site. Well, they've already site. had several landing site workshops to get it down to three. Okay. So that's, they've been working on that for a long time. Very, very cool. And because the, the landing site not only has to be a place where we, you know, can fulfill our scientific objectives, it also has to be a place we can operate the rover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do and that so, safely as right. well. So, um, and also land it too, because there's, like, there's... Right, but that's another upgrade that we have. Uh, we have a much more uh, smart landing system. A smarter landing system? Yes, because before, you know, our landing ellipse was huge. Uh -huh. And so when Curiosity landed, she was a long way from where she really needed to be. And so we had to traverse. And so hopefully with this new landing, you know, radar and uh, intelligent system, 
we'll be able to say, oh, look, there's bad stuff here. Oh, here's a good landing slide. And so our landing ellipse will be smaller and we can land closer to where we really want to be. How does it do that? Is it's, there, it's magic. It's magic? The magic of engineering, well, JPL's magic. So, uh, well, actually, you, I, I gave you a slide on that, too. Yeah, I think there's like in, there's a, like imaging systems on board, right. and they'll compare to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter images, well, right. and then steer Mars 2020 accordingly where it needs right. to go. So, and that was so cool yeah. that they're working on that. So, like, up, up, and, upgrade and we, your EDL. Yeah, and we had stuff, we had landing radar on Curiosity's landing. Mm -hmm. But that was just to make sure you didn't land, you know, like, oh my gosh, there's something really dangerous with the rover, don't go there. Mm -hmm. But we're hoping to get much more, you know, pinpoint landings. Yeah, and uh, there were a lot of questions in our chat room about sort of what's the, what's the next thing after Mars 2020? Like, like is, is, there a hmm. con is there an expected continuation? Um, or are we sort of looking at the last rover before people actually land on Mars? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm not even sure NASA headquarters knows the answer to that. But the Mars program office is hoping there'll be more because no matter how many people that you can send, that's still a little ways away. But we're mm -hmm. working towards that because you remember on Curiosity, we had the radiation detector mm -hmm. that measured the radiation that the space, that the rover saw from here to Mars and has continued to measure radiation as we drive around Mars. And on 2020, we have MOXIE, which if you saw the Martian, you remember the oxygenator they had? Mm -hmm that made oxygen for Mark Watney and everybody. Yeah. So that's what Moxie will do. She's a demonstrator, and she's going to try and make oxygen out of the Mars atmosphere. Holy smokes. Yeah. That's slightly important uh, for it's, a crewed it's, mission. It's hugely important. So that's one of our scientific objectives is to prepare for men to go to Mars. Oh. Or women. Anyone. Anyone. People. So, yeah, people. Folks. Yeah. So, Us. Yeah. <laughs> All this to go. So. Um, and uh, and uh, also, I remember there was a question in there, too, um, as well, about uh, if you guys were planning to do any sort of, like, rover-style missions elsewhere besides Mars. Is there well, it's sort been of, talked about because, you know, yeah. um, the Navy or somebody has a rover that will drive on the underside of ice. Yeah, it's positively buoyant, <gasps> so it goes up yeah. and it, it like, rolls al along the bottom of the ice. It is really awesome, yeah. right? Could you imagine sending that, like, to, to Enceladus? Yeah, and I, and I was actually at a talk uh, up at Griffith about yeah. that, um, and they were talking about that w the water ice meeting area mm -hmm. uh, here on Earth is a very, uh, is a very uh, biologically rich area. Mm -hmm. It's, like, a, a very important Important area for life, and they think that that might be a way to do it, and that's very yeah. exciting to hear that. So. Yeah, there's been all sorts of things proposed, and uh, and I'm just not sure what we'll do next because yeah. people have also proposed like a hot air balloon sort of thing for a uh, balloon for um, Titan, mm -hmm. and you just kind of float along and do your science. Yeah, I think they also sort of gave the go ahead on a drone. Yeah, that like lands a, like a like a, like a Hexacopter or something. Yeah, on, yeah, it looks for really Titan. cool. Yeah. So, which is really neat because Titan's atmosphere is actually thicker than the Earth's. Yeah. So you can actually make something with like smaller blades and it will still fly just as yeah, well. So, yep. Yeah, that is yeah, so cool. Yeah, I read that proposal. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's that's, that's a very really exciting cool, yeah. mission. Um, so, drones on other planets. Here we go. Yeah. So, they're going everywhere now. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, too, just about JPL. Because JPL's like, JPL's been around a lot longer than most people think it is. Oh, yeah. It started back in the 1930s. It was just it was just a bunch of students. You know, they basically almost blew up their dorm room. Yeah. And instead of getting mad at them, the 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 the, the head people in charge were basically like, oh, no, you know, go down to Arroyo Seco, um, this little, like, uh, yeah. wash, and, yeah, you know, exactly go play right. with your stuff down there. So what's it, what is it like working for JPL? What's amazing working at JPL? I mean, you work with so many people from different backgrounds and so many brilliant people, it's, it's really, it can be overwhelming at times, but, mm -hmm. but it's, it's fun, it's fantastic, it's amazing. Yeah. And you never know what you're gonna be doing next year. Yeah, and you guys are, as I, you know, I jokingly say it, but JPL really does make the impossible possible. You guys are, you guys do things that are just like unbelievable. Well, like, that's only because they, they, they hire some really great people and, mm -hmm. and people aren't afraid to fail. Yeah. That's I mean, because that stops you from doing so much. Mm -hmm. Because people say, you can't do that because that's impossible. Well, let's figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's JPL. Let's figure out how to do that. Yeah. And there is an interesting thing about JPL, which is that, that if I remember correctly, uh, NASA doesn't technically run JPL, right? No, JPL is run by Caltech. JPL, mm -hmm. uh, NASA pays, JPL, uh, pays Caltech money to run JPL. So we're all actually Caltech employees. Interesting. We're so. not NASA employees. <laughs> Well, so. so I guess you just like sort of work under the purview of NASA. Well, especially because um, NASA 
builds all our buildings and buys all our furniture and stuff. And uh, so, and in return, you give them spacecraft and things. Yes. So yes. it's like a nice deal with you there. It is. It's great. So. I mean, it's it's fantastic to be a NASA center. I mean, how amazing is that to work at a NASA center? Yeah. But yeah, but but since, like you said, JPL was started before NASA even existed. And, and it, then it was became a NASA center. Yeah, as uh, Johnny Boy is saying uh, in our chat room, uh, JPL is to NASA what Skunk Works is to Lockheed, with a little happy face there. So, mm -hmm. um, and that I'd say that's a that's a pretty darn fair assessment. Uh, so, Kim, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, oh, you're we're, welcome. We're going to wrap it up by doing what we always do with every interview, which is that we ask uh, we ask four questions. There are no right or wrong answers to this. Okay. This, is, this is all you. This is all your opinion, how you feel about it. Um, so, ready for the four questions? I'm ready. Okay. So, the first question is, what is your favorite space mission, past, present, or future? My favorite space mission? Mm -hmm. And oh, it could be robotic oh, and it'd, crude. It would be Apollo 11. Apollo 11. So, the, the, you know, the one that did it. So. Yeah, but Apollo 12 was probably a lot more fun to be on. <laughs> <laughs> Those astronauts looked like they had a lot of fun, and they got to spelunk around a lot longer, and, mm -hmm. and they actually landed next to a surveyor and went over and plunked pieces off of her. Yeah. So maybe so, I'll change it to Apollo 12. Yeah. That was awesome mission. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, one, it's my favorite Apollo mission, yeah. honestly. So. Uh, all right, second question, um, and I kind of have a feeling where you're going to go with it because everybody's kind of been saying the same thing um, with this, uh, which is the second question is, human or robotic exploration of the cosmos? Well, for right now, I favor robotic exploration mm -hmm. because right now we, we can do that. We can go more places and we're not as limited. But what we haven't figured out how to do yet is to protect the humans once they get out there because that's not a place we were meant to go. Mm -hmm. So for right now, I favor robotic exploration, but I would really like to see us expand human presence out there too. Yeah, excellent. And uh, where should we go next? Mm. Either robotic or crude or both. Wow, so. I think we need to go back to Saturn. I think we need to go to Titan or Enceladus. And do some more work there? Yeah, because uh, Cassini found out so much, but we were limited because even though we were there a long time, you know, there was only so many flybys of Titan, and especially Enceladus, far fewer of Enceladus. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's already surprised us, and it would be nice to go and learn more. Yeah. And our final question, which is also my favorite question uh, to ask people, which is, why space? Why space? Because we're humans and we, we explore. That's what we do. We learn. We expand our knowledge. And, and I think especially by studying places like Titan, that's kind of a prebiotic Earth, that we can learn more about us. The more we learn out there, the more we know about us. Excellent. All right. Kim Stedman, our systems engineer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, we really appreciate your stories that you said and the, the swath of your career and talking about that today. So thanks for coming on. Thanks. Appreciate All it. Right. And coming up, we have your comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow right after this. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, Let's explore the science of tomorrow. Now, before we get into your comments from last week's show, we want to give a huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. And we also want to thank our orbital citizens and, of course, our suborbital citizens. These people contribute $2.50 per episode or $5 a month. And, of course, guys, every single bit helps, and we wouldn't be able to con continue making any of these shows if it wasn't for you guys. So if you'd like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now... Last week, we had an awesome conversation with Isaac Arthur from, uh, we were talking about humanity amongst the stars and of course his YouTube channel, uh, Science and uh, Futurism with Isaac Arthur. And that was on Orbit 11, not 23. It was a really awesome talk. Oh, yeah, I, I had a great time um, interviewing him. So some of the comments that we got were really fun. I was reading through them right before uh, starting the show. 
music. The first one comes off of YouTube from uh, Adukt Land, uh, and he says, regarding Jared's concern, do you really think concerning Europa and Enceladus are better and more interesting candidates for life uh, anyway than contaminating Mars would be for bad science? What are the progress in all other fields of knowledge as a result of getting scientists to Mars as soon as possible outweigh the quick contamination of Mars, which probably can't be prevented anyhow? Also, couldn't people on Mars simply remote control a sample getter via satellite link from the other side of the planet real time? in real time? Uh, because looking at Elon's place... Pace. Pace. No, sorry about that. I was like, wait. Yeah. Pace. Because looking at Elon's pace, um, there's not going to be a choice. So that's a bit long of a comment. But um, yeah, I'm sorry. I broke my own rule of wall attack. You know, I should have <laughs> edited that down. I did. I picked I, that. I was like, yep. I yeah, I yeah. I know. I broke my own rule. <laughs> it's my own dumb fault. I'm the only one who doesn't follow the rules. No, 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 no. And I, that was. I should have trimmed that down. I'm sorry. <laughs> But that, yeah. that was to you. So yeah, I think I that know. was to you. Like, yeah, um, do, do you think uh, like planetary contamination? <laughs> yeah. or planetary contamination is it actually that big of a deal? It is a big of a deal, uh, mm. especially if you're trying to find life. If if your ultimate goal is to find life and you contaminate where you're trying to look, but didn't Viking already contaminate? No, Viking was to the planetary protection standards that it needed to be. That so, it needed to be. Yes. All right. Those those <laughs> standards that were established in pre-Viking, mm -hmm. um, which Viking w essentially caused those standards to be <laughs> caused developed. Those standards. Okay. Yeah. Um, because they were going to do. They did biological tests mm -hmm. with Viking. So that was. Uh, they made that space. They made those two landers as absolutely sterile as possible. Because but, they did not want to have mm, anything work yeah, with that. But as sterile as possible and absolutely no contamination are two different things. So it, it, well, is sterilization there, should remove your contamination. Right. So I guess my, my point is should is also a qualifier. Mm -hmm. So yes. it did. <laughs> right? so, I hear a whole lot of qualifiers here. So it did. There's mm -hmm. no contamination well, of Mars do, whatsoever at this point. Essentially, the contamination standards um, are designed to remove as much potential for contamination as possible. So then back to the comment, though. Mm -hmm. we're, we're putting human. Elon Musk is putting humans on Mars mm -hmm. as fast as possible. Yes. The moment human number one steps foot on Mars, mm -hmm. we have contaminated that planet. It essentially, yes. Right. So, so, does it actually matter at this point? Um, well, if you want to make sure that uh, that you have that that absolute sample that really does make it happen. You know that this is the absolute confirmation that there is life on Mars. You really do not want to have any kind of contamination whatsoever. But unless Mars 2020 or any of the previous orbiters or mm -hmm. um, not orbiter, orbiters won't help much. Lander. Uh, landers or uh, <laughs> rovers, <laughs> maybe an orbiter could find. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Unless they find something prior mm -hmm. to a human stepping foot on on Mars. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's essentially it, isn't it? From that moment forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, you kind of can't trust any of your samples anymore. Essentially, the the steps that have been taken in order to sterilize, decontaminate, and make sure uh, that these spacecraft that we land on the surface of Mars are as clean as possible. Those we've done it as best as we can. We also have the, there's also the advantage of f the fact that you are flying through space in order to get there, so you don't, you know, you're in a hard vacuum, you get radiation, all that other fun stuff. And also, Mars actually shouldn't really be too conducive of a place uh, for a vast majority of the life here on Earth and what it needs and its, and its things in order to actually uh, uh, work with that. Uh, so we've done everything that we can in order to make sure that we have done. But so that, you know, I, but I don't think that's really the point. So I, I think what they're getting at, we're spending way more time on this than I thought uh -huh. we were, right? So I, I think the point is, look, we're going to contaminate Mars. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that's going to happen, and it's likely going Absolutely. to happen. Absolutely, we leave soon. trash everywhere we go. I mean, we there's, still, trash. there's still poop on the moon from <laughs> Apollo. So. <laughs> that might so. be the shirt for the show. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> there is. So, so, so. instead of looking for life on Mars, because we're going to contaminate it soon, mm -hmm. right? We, we're we're hitting the end of uh, the uh, end of the ability to search realistically search for life. Mm -hmm. Despite like Vax in the chat room is saying, I disagree. You're only contaminating mm. a very small area of the planet. Keep some yes, areas. Yes, the area pristine. around that you're going to take the samples at, though. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think oh. at that point so. you know, we're splitting here. You're, you're contaminating yeah. the planet. So should, maybe we should stop trying to use Mars as a bed for looking for Earth and move instead to 
maybe something that's a little more interesting, like Europa, or someplace where we're not immediately, like we're not actively trying to put humans on Europa right yeah. now. Yeah, Europa, Enceladus, maybe Titan. Sure. Titan's so, a big, a and, big shrug and, up in the there, air. And so. there's some more interesting things to be said for life on someplace like Europa, although also very hard to potentially sure. get to. Sure. Uh, so why don't we focus on those areas instead of Mars at this point? Because uh, well, I think it's more sort of why. Uh, why not all of them? I this guess, should be around. This way. is a way deeper conversation. Yes. I think is, is <laughs> yes. possible. You wait. I, you know, I've this only been great. asking. This is so great. The, the, this is great. The, the, the commenter asked Jared, but let me swing it back this direction. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I know it's directed toward, towards Jared. So I know, but what? you know, who cares? I mean, this I is, mean, yeah. So what do you think? I mean, I, I just feel like, um, um, regardless, we're going to be getting people, um, you know, off of Earth into another planet or even on a moon or whatever it is, wherever we go. So it's going to happen. Um, I know that we have really high sterilization, um, like levels, like and different things that we have to do protocol. Um, and I think that's great, especially for having robotic missions strictly on these planets, to cl so that we can collect samples, so that we can know what's there before we arrive. Um, but I think regardless, if we're going to end up somewhere, and you think about it too, Earth has been contaminated by ex like elsewhere in, in the solar system. Where we've had collisions a million times from, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like asteroids a long time ago, and now like there's constantly space debris entering into obviously Earth's atmosphere and, and onto our planet. So wouldn't we also, in a sense, be contaminated from elsewhere? So are we all sort of part of a big contamination itself? Yeah, aren't we in and of us the actual uh, yeah. original galactic contamination? And then you think about it too, like what <laughs> really is the term of contamination? If we all are essentially made of the same exact elements, we're not. We can't really contaminate what we're made of. So that's just my kind of like mm -hmm. like outlook on it. I know I, I understand that if we go to Mars, like maybe there's certain things they don't have that we have, but well, that it doesn't have the planet doesn't have that we don't have. Um, but I, I still, regardless, I think that if we're going to be going there one day, it's going to happen. Um, I just, you know, as far as the main worry that we should have uh, as far as getting humans there is if disease was to start. That's, I think, I think that the, the next level, but that's like far, far in advance. Um, I think right now there's not too much that, that would happen because we haven't found any bacteria and we haven't found any parasites, we haven't found anything. So I think that there's not really too much of a concern. Um, but until I think the first most important thing is to collect those samples from whatever the rovers are that are on there, whatever landers we're gonna have you know, arriving there and continue research and then obviously get humans there. Um, so that, that's that window shrinking. What I'm saying it is. So it is, yeah. But anyway, so, okay. So I think we should move on. Well, to wait, hang the on. Before you do, before okay. you do, and I know this is your show. <laughs> Space Mike, your turn. Mike, uh, yes. your, your opinion on that as well. Okay. We have no audio. So we I have don't hear you. A silent Space Mike. <laughs> hold up. Hold that thought, Mike. Sorry. So, what's what's going on there here? There you there go. We go. There we you hear go. You now. All right. One more time. Okay. Okay. Um, so my opinion is I am on board for contamination. I mean, I want to start sending <laughs> stuff to Mars right away. If we do discover something that is native to Mars, then you know, then we'll deal with that when, when it comes. But even if we do discover something that's native to Mars and it's just some simple bacteria or some simple virus, whatever. Let's start sending stuff so we can start terraforming the planet. We can make it habitable for humans, and let's do that all over the solar system. You know, if we find something on Europa that is complex marine life or something like that, then we'll leave it alone, you know, just like the 2001 and 2010. All these worlds are yours except for Rio, Europa. But I'm not going to leave Mars alone if we just find bacteria. Screw that. Let's, let's expand. <laughs> We are the dominant species in this solar system. Wow, you know, this this really is, I think, a round table because one could argue, you know, we, we came from those little spores as well, right? We I mean, sure did. So, yeah. you know, so. yeah, you know, we're the dominant species now, but you know, the the, the Galactic timelines are much different than a human timeline, and so give it a billion years, what would that little bacteria have turned into? What mm -hmm. life are we stopping? That is a that whole is different a great, topic. That is it an is, ethical is, minefield. It is an ethical that you minefield. Are running through that blindfolded. We, that we are totally going to probably bring up on this show and watch us stumble and fall oh flat gosh. first onto one of those mines. It will be amazing. <laughs> Please, Capcom, keep us going. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. so we're going to move on, and we'll, we'll get into that another time. So the next comment Ooh. comes off of Twitter from S3B Mai. They say, those rockets will be pretty much dead on arrival. Anything solid will be commercially incapable of competing with SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin in the next two to three years. you got to deconstruct all the acronyms. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, talking to Space Mike and the... Um, uh, the Orbital ATK, a space division of Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems, uh, their new mm -hmm. uh, all-solid <laughs> rocket. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what it was. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, all of their different uh, solid rockets that they have available, and I mean, the Omega rocket is just one of a potential rocket that they could assemble from all of the different stuff that they have available. Um, and I think they haven't, as far as the Omega rocket, they haven't put out any prices yet, but as far as like the the minotaurs and pegasus rockets i mean they're still uh, pegasus is going to have to start competing with like launcher one and all that sort of stuff but i feel like there's still a, a strong enough of a big business case for these solids for at least a couple more years once uh once spacex gets down below you know the 10 million dollar range for uh launches on a falcon 9 then sure then then i would agree with you that solids are, are dead on arrival but i think it's going to be a little while before uh spacex and blue origin have a uh, uh monopoly so to speak uh, as far as launch prices go so i think that the pricing <laughs> Um, uh, duopoly, yeah, thank you. I think that the launch pricing is still going to have a very uh, strong effect on the industry for many years to come. Right. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I'm, or, I'm, I agree. I do? personally am looking forward um, not only to just uh, Blue Origin coming and challenging SpaceX, because out of the challenge comes really good mm -hmm. things. Um, I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to who's going to come along later down the line and challenge SpaceX and Blue Origin. Yeah. So, and that's really just, where just that United where, Launch Alliance has done in response to the challenge from SpaceX. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've lowered their prices so much, gotten rid of so much overhead. I mean, they're, I'm. Yeah, but they're yeah. still missing the point entirely. They're still in that old school, non-reusable, like, oh, we'll just jettison the engines. And I, I like Tori, and he, he's a great guy. I just do not, I just don't see that particular vision. I don't, uh, yeah. I don't know. I will, I will say that I don't know if it's going to work. And that's why I'm okay watching these companies roll the dice to see if it is going to work. Because <laughs> Just because, you know, that, that's the method that they use doesn't mean that they're not going to still be viable after that. That's fair. You I know, mean, we, yeah. we've, uh, reusability if, of any kind was not something in the commercial sector at all. It's been sort of exclusive to shuttle. Mm -hmm. And then that's... Yeah. Then we can we can, have a, round, we can have a round table about that yeah, as well. So refurbishability, um, not reusability. Or as I say, reusability <laughs> or learning how to do reusability the wrong way. So, <laughs> so, which is which? That's you know sometimes you have to do that. I, actually, yeah. I, so. I think what sets I think what sets the companies apart is a little bit about what Kim talked is the the new space companies that are take the approach of failure is an option. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. Let's, let's not try to fail, but let's mm -hmm. be willing to fail and learn from it. And that's the important yeah. thing, is if you fail, you have to yeah. learn, otherwise it was useless. Um, th there is a willingness to fail mm -hmm. over and over and over again, but get a little bit better each time. Yeah. And a lot of the old companies are not willing to do that. And I, that's, I think might be where I draw the line, is if yeah. you're not willing to try new things and fail at it, then you're going to be stuck with what you've got now. You will not... You, that's what you've got. You can't exceed beyond that. Yeah. Uh, whereas the other companies will have, you know, they can do incredible things that you can't even dream of today. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I, Donna I, brings I, up a really good point in the chat, actually. Sorry. Um, he says, uh, look at the sheer number of different airplanes that were developed in the early days of NACA and NASA and see who survived. Uh, there were a lot of companies that figured out what didn't work, and I don't think there's been uh, it's been fully explored for mm. rockets just yet. And I yeah. completely agree, which is why I think this is great as far as what a lot of companies are doing with trying to make it more like airplanes. I feel like with rockets, we're sort of in the 1910s of aviation right now. Uh, yeah, know? sort of the late 1910s. Like it's a good we, way to look at we've, it. We've got a good idea think, of how it works, and yeah, we're kind of we're tinkering with different things now. And we're sort of starting to get into that time where the NACA is starting to come in and really start mm -hmm. to start to change how things are doing because they're the ones who brought in the ideas of wind tunnel testing and things mm, like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was revolutionary to aircraft during that time period. Um, so I think we're starting to see that uh, from from both the commercial companies coming in and also uh, you know like NASA enabling commercial companies to do that as well, sort of giving them uh, the, the credence to end up sort of trying out these different things. Um, and then if it works, mutual, mutually beneficial both ways to both that commercial company and NASA for what they need. And this is sort of this, this really interesting experiment to be yeah. living through right now. Yeah, so, this is totally, we're analogy. part of history, guys. Well, what? what's that, Mike? Yeah. 
That's a good analogy too, because I feel like um, uh, you know, in that, or maybe even a little bit later from the 1910s, you know, with airplanes, they were starting to experiment a lot more with uh, unique and exotic things. You know, seen water landings, mm -hmm. jet assisted mm -hmm. takeoff, you know, different engine configurations, all sorts of different uh, wing configurations, and just all sorts of different stuff, experimenting to figure out what works best. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a good analogy. We're in that period right now of yes, we have things that can fly and things that can work, but let's experiment with some exotic stuff to see what works better. Yeah, but we exactly. also need like to get that. out of that mode a little bit in the not too distant future. We, you know, you get on an airplane today and you don't mm -hmm. go, hope I make it to my destination. I mean, that's true, yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> but so but you know, you put Mars 2020 on a rocket and you're like, ha, 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 please right. launch correct. Right? We, we, and, and that I still happens. There's that. that still kind of moment of like, what's gonna happen? You can't have that right. if we're going to colonize the solar system. It has to be much more like commercial aviation where you just get on the rocket and you expect yep. it to work. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's where we need to get to. So mm -hmm. yeah, we can do some experimentation, but eventually yeah. we have to get to a point where we expect yeah. it to work. I would say with- That's not now. Mm -hmm. I would say with carrying people, it's right now the equivalent of like 1920s aviation, which is that- Yeah. It's, that some- Still using a, square windows? More- <laughs> All right, Comet. Um, so, um, That's great. Yeah, it's it's more more than it's more successful flights uh, than 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 unsuccessful flights. But there's still like crashes and things sure. that yeah. happen. So we're still cutting our teeth in how things should be working. So yeah, exactly. Alrighty, awesome. Next comment comes off of YouTube from Preston T Crow, and they say, "I love the discussion about how space is inclusive for all people. I would even expand that to all of science. I am a science teacher at a charter school, high school, charter high school, for the performing." arts. My students are not focused on science, but I tell them that orbital colonies will need live music shows. I tell them that they could be the first movie director or film a movie entirely on the surface of Mars. Space and science needs everyone. Absolutely. And I love that. That is that is like super, yep. super exciting. I, I remember um, everyone got super stoked in like 2013 because Lady Gaga actually announced that she was going to be the first musician to perform in space. Um, I know that, you know, unfortunately didn't get to work out um, just because of the where she was going to fly on um, they, they, they weren't couldn't make it past the, the test launch um, but you know they had a few issues but it, that's where we're moving to in the future I mean mm -hmm. obviously it was a little premature in 2013 2014 to be making that type of proposal but I think in the next 10 still, years still might be a little still, even if you did is, it today little, yeah. I mean I think I think at least in the next future generation we're like um, six months cool. out yeah mm -hmm. what, what would you guys <laughs> is that six months out okay. Oh, okay six months you know we need like a <laughs> county ticker on the bottom of the screen of how many times we say we're six months out I was Ding. just talking I was just talking about this uh, um, on Twitter the other day with a couple people, which is like, oh, what would nice. your ultimate crew to yeah. uh, to a place be? And I was like, I'd want uh, like an engineer, um, a doctor, uh, like a computer scientist, uh, a botanist, and an artist. Yeah. So because nice. I, there's like different ways to interpret everything, and I know that astronauts get trained in how to do photography and in film and public, not the same public relations and things. But oh man, the touch of an artist really brings something out uh, about it, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a photographer. You know, it could you could send a poet in order to do it. You could send that with it. I just think it would be really interesting in order to actually yeah. do that. So, oh yeah. <laughs> Should have sent a poet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know, actually good point. Okay I, to the, go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Destructive 1701, you do bring up a good point. Lady Gaga has already been beaten by Chris Hedfield. Ah! So yeah, a musician, well, yes. But oh, I meant, I meant well a, perfor a performance in space. And but, look at yes, what happened when he musician. came out with that. Yeah. That just went everywhere. Yeah. And people yeah. like actually paid attention to the yes, International Space Station exactly. for about six hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. But I, I think that would be that would be really, really great. So I think if, if we were to go so up there. Juno you Cam kind it? of falls into that same, I, knew, yeah. I know it's not saying, but it's Juno that same concept of like one of those afterthoughts. But when you, uh, but when you I actually know, reach out, <laughs> you, okay, so they can't hear this on camera, but there was like a ring ring <laughs> that went by. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, we're taking too much time on that, but yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, cool, um, awesome. I was actually going to ask a question to the chat, but I don't remember what it was now, so I'm gonna move on um, to the next question. Um, oh, it was like, what, what, um, if you guys, what would be the first song that you'd wanna hear? Um, oh, that's a great question. Yeah, Cause also like, well, well the Juno Mission too, their app actually ended up, um, they made music that ended up on Apple, uh, Apple Music, mm -hmm. uh, and it was created by the Juno Mission, but if, nice. you know, if you guys were to see who would be wanting, 
your first concert in space, what would you want to? So something else going on, uh, uh, really quick. Oh, so, okay. uh, so at Company X, uh, uh, the the group that does the music prior to the webcast and then the coast phase music, it's Test Shot Starfish, which is super easy to mispronounce. Test Shot so, Starfish. Yeah, yeah. So Test Shot Starfish. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, they actually are coming out, uh, they, they have on their, um, Spotify? Spotify, okay. Or SoundCloud? Mm -hmm. SoundCloud. 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 Uh, you can actually download a lot of that music, and they're trying <gasps> to make it something where you can Ooh. get like this space music and create space this music. art and music around the idea of space and launches Ooh. and going to space and things. Yes. So that's a real thing that's actually happening right now. I'm sorry. That's you. awesome. Space oh, music. I was yeah, just going to say, in an instance... Finally start remixing their music. Oh, yeah. boy. I was going to say, in an instance, there was a really cool video um, that had been put out by the European Space Agency of the Huygens descent onto Titan, in not in real time, but it showed what every instrument was doing, and every instrument actually had a noise mm -hmm. that, or a tone that was specifically assigned to it. And then the uh, artist, MIA, actually ended up sampling... Uh, that video for one of her songs. Actually, so, which okay, is so, super cool. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time, and I realize this show is absurdly long. But <laughs> here's, here's, here's something that I've always wanted. This will literally be a two-hour show. Here's something I've always wanted to do and have have not been able to do it yet. I would like the theme music for Tomorrow Space to be made from sounds from space. Uh, there are like sounds that these different spacecraft pick up. Yeah, you like can magnetic convert, fields, yeah, radio. You can convert yeah. some of the instruments into an audible uh, mm -hmm. audible sound. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be like purely, like, but, like you can kind of you know tweak it and manipulate it a little bit, but if we can make the, the theme music like really, truly spacey, and there's a little bit of that with the Quindar tones in the current open, but I'd love to take it, like, just turn that to 11. Well, that I can definitely so tell cool. you, if you need a good beat in the background, pulsars are good for that. Yeah, and yeah. that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that'd be really cool, and there are a lot of really artistic people out in the Tomorrow community, so if you are bored... DJ. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, like, like look at the current video open that we've got. I want to use the same video yeah. open, but try to, try to you know, like, el el eliminate the music and just create something with sounds from space. Wouldn't mm -hmm. that be be cool. Okay. <laughs> that would be and, awesome. And to your question, in the comments, I'd love to know what kind of art, like down in the comments, down, I can't reach far enough, down there, down there. Uh, leave your comments, yeah, oh. way down there, down there. Uh, leave your comments, like what kind of art, what kind of music do you want to hear? Uh, like, like what shows would you want to see if you what, went to space? You, you're like, on your way to Mars, like what's your nine month playlist? I would want to see Hamlet. I mean, yeah. that's totally, I mean, it's For not nine music, like, oh, no, no, nine month playlist. <laughs> you're oh, nine you're month playlist. The, the travel there. Okay, they're talking about once you arrive, I was like, I want to see a play by, you know, okay, different, yeah, well, nine month <laughs> playlist, okay. Totally rephrasing your question. I'm going to go to the next question. Yes. So it comes off of YouTube from Star Tsar. Um, Star Tsar. Star Tsar. I, I was thinking like, sow, like General Sal's chicken, so Sal. So that was like Tsar. So Star Tsar. Tsar? Tsar? Mm. That'd be the Tsar. T would be yeah. silent. So it'd be star, sar. Anyway. Sure. Okay. Humanity is moving way too slow. The prospect of never beholding the stars haunts me. It haunts me too. It makes me worried that like, we'll haunted. never <laughs> we're haunted. I mean, it like, you know, like, what, what if we never, what if, I mean, I don't think we'll ever not make it to, you know, obviously moving to that point where we actually can do, um, you we're know, working interplanetary. On it. Yeah. So. We're working on it. I see it happening. I mean, I don't know if they're referring to like interstellar travel, which is. I mean, you guys, what are your opinions on Best that? Of luck. <laughs> Best so, of luck. Best of luck. That sounds like to me. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not our lifetime. At least uh, uh, humans, our, not, our lifetime, yeah. uh, I mean, realistically, mm -hmm. and I hope I'm wrong, but our lifetime is Mars. Our, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's 10 to 20 years, uh, humans on Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think actually in that same exact time frame, humans on the moon. That, mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's realistic slash six months out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Ding. Um, so, <laughs> ding. Was that you or you? Who did the ding? Is that you? All right. Thanks, um, Yeah, awesome. Cool. So I'm going to go to then our last comments here. Comes off of YouTube. Comes from Luke's Day Off. Glad you have a day off, Luke. Yeah. Okay. I want one. Uh, <laughs> he says, nice, didn't know you guys, but thanks to Isaac, I am now a sub. Sweet! Welcome, thanks Luke. For subscribing. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, Welcome. Luke. And thank you to everyone who's coming over from Isaac's channel. Uh, we're glad to have you here. I hope you enjoy the shows. Uh, it was a lot of fun having Isaac yes. on. Uh, that was awesome. And yeah. thank you to Isaac. He, uh, he did a little promo for us at the end of his saw, last video. Yeah. That was really nice of him. Nice. We didn't need to do that, but yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. That yeah, was really and cool. Like on Facebook so. and everything, too. Oh, yeah. That was, that My was awesome. gosh. Thank you, Isaac. 
Yeah, so this has been so, a great show. This has been really awesome. And so before we go, I want to give a um, big thank you and recognize our ground support citizens. So these people contribute $1 per episode or $1 per month. And of course, guys, every single bit helps and we wouldn't be able to continue making these awesome shows if it weren't for you. So if you'd like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. Now, Next week, I am super excited for this. Um, I'm gonna be interviewing Dr. Charles Liu, who's an astrophysicist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Um, he New actually York! <laughs> got That's how you have that. to say that. <laughs> I have to. New York! Um, oh man, he's doing so many awesome things. He actually was uh, my mentor when I was doing research at the Hayden Planetarium. and. Mm -hmm. He works primarily on observational galaxy evolution, usually um, ma mainly uh, star formation histories of field galaxies, and it also includes uh, the spectrophotometric study of starburst galaxies, which Goodness. are really, really cool, and post-starburst objects and colliding, merging, and interacting galaxies. Um, and of course, also in his free times, he does uh, quasar hunting, which is which is pretty cool. Which is a thing normal which people is, do. Just a hobby. Time. It's, it's just like a thing. A, yeah. Just yeah. a hobby. Yeah, it's it's like, research. you know, I have some free time. I'll search for a quasar. It's a thing I do. It's the best. Oh, man. When He's I get so bored cool. and I need to go to sleep, I just you know pull up some data and hunt for some <laughs> we'll quasars. Look for quasars. So, yeah. Yeah. I call there's, a grad student. Oh, and I'm just like, hey, yeah. you got any data? Seriously, there's there's so many so. websites where you literally could be like hunting this stuff on your own. You got any data? Need the data. Oh my gosh. Well, anyway. <laughs> on that note, thank you so much, guys, and we will talk to you guys soon. And if you're watching live, we have after after dark, right after this, after dark, after. Okay, bye. <laughs>